בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, thank you again for having me again. Uh, the uh, Shirei more popular on YouTube, oh Hashem, I like it. Uh, this is, you know, when you organize a Shirei, you're uh, part of the whole, uh, part of the whole mitzvah of Zikui HaRabim. Uh, so it's a, uh, it's great to do more Shirei now and, uh, and really try to reach out to different Jews from everywhere, you know, where, you know it's, it's amazing with the Jewish people is that it's, when you tell them some of these things, it's almost, in some cases, people don't want to hear it. You know, some people just don't want to hear it. Like, no, they're used to their life, they're used to doing whatever they're doing in their life. But most people, it's almost like they've never heard any of this stuff before. They've gone to Shul Torah, they've gone to the Beit Knesset, they've done, uh, you know, they've prayed here and there, they had a Bar Mitzvah. But when you tell them, listen, you're not allowed to drive on Shabbat, and they tell you, no, but what if I'm driving to Shul? And you explain to them, no, it's, you can't drive to Shul, it's not, it's, you can't do a Mitzvah by doing a sin. There's no such thing. And you explain to the people what uh, the significance of, uh, of each mitzvah and what we need to do. And it's like, it, it's brand new. I have one guy that's uh, been uh, studying. I've been studying with him for about a little over a year. And uh, before he started, you know, before he started coming to my shulim, it was amazing. He, uh, he's been driving to shul for 20 years. And he told me, no one ever told me I'm not allowed to drive. No one ever told me. And that's unfortunately the mentality today with, with, uh, with rabbis and uh, with other people that were so concerned, especially in the United States, were so concerned about being politically correct that we forget about being correct. You know, we're, we're so concerned about not turning people off and being scared that, oh, if I tell him the truth, maybe he's not going to come back, maybe he's not going to donate, maybe he's going to uh, not like it, maybe he's going to be offended, maybe, 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 maybe. And people start doing the cheshbon of Shemaim, they start doing the accounting of Shemaim, they start deciding, you know, what is going to happen, as if they know the future. You don't know anything, you're just a human being. You start from a, you know putrid seed and you uh, live your life as a body and then you go back into the ground like every other human being the worms and maggots eat us and then we go and Neshama leaves that's it There's no, we don't know anything about the future we're not prophets so when, when we decide for people of what they can handle what they can't handle we're trying to be many prophets it's not our job to be prophets this is what Hashem wrote and that's all we say it's not our business to say what you know to decide which part is good, which part is not good. I'm sure that when Hashem wrote the Torah, He took us into, into uh, his, uh, our generation into mind. He said, okay, it's going to come a generation that's so far from Torah that people are going to be scared of keeping Shabbat. Or people are going to be scared of, uh, you know, they're going to be embarrassed to wear a kippah in the street because they don't want their non-Jewish friends to make fun of them. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a generation. I'm sure He took us into mind. You know, He created the heaven and the earth. I'm sure He took us into mind. It's not our job to decide for people what they can handle, what they can't handle, with the basics. Now, of course, there are some things that are above the basics, and you need to know how to tell people how to, you know, things to do. If somebody doesn't know anything, you can't talk to them in a way where you pretty much tell them, listen, by tomorrow you have to keep all 613 mitzvot. Even the ones that are not relevant to us, you have to keep, you can't. It's going to overwhelm them. But you can't tell them, listen, it's okay for you to violate Shabbat openly and, you know, because you're not ready for it. There's no such thing. You have to tell people, listen, you have to keep Shabbat. If you're not ready for it, that's your business. But at least you need to know that you need to do it. So this is a, just like at work. You know, if your boss is coming to you, he says, listen, I need you to make, I need you to bring in $100,000 every month worth of sales. Right now, you just started. You only bring in $5,000 a month. So he's not going to fire you tomorrow because you didn't get to $100,000. He can't expect you to make $100,000 by your second day or by your second week or even by your second month. But he has to give you some type of goal that you have to aim towards. You have to get to this point. You have to know what the goal is in order for you to get there. Because if you don't know what the goal is, how are you ever going to get there? You're just a blind. A blind, you know, it's, it's like a chicken without a head. You have no idea where you're going. So if you tell somebody, listen, it's okay for you to drive to, uh, to shul or drive on Shabbat and not keep Shabbat for now, and eventually you can keep Shabbat, the reason why that's a flawed strategy uh, despite the fact that it's very, very popular today, where people tell people that they could drive on Shabbat as long as they're going to Beknesset, or maybe one day they'll do Shabbat, it's a completely flawed 
uh, mentality because in a human mindset we're always going to listen to the Yetzirah's opinion. The Yetzirah, the evil inclination, is always going to give us his opinion. And he's going to tell us eventually, even if we're starting to keep mitzvot in two months and three months and four months and five months, and then eventually the rabbi comes to him and he goes, okay, listen, it's time for you to keep Shabbat. He says, why? Six months into it. Yeah, but if it was good for six months not to keep Shabbat, let's see what happens over the next six months without keeping Shabbat. So a year passes, and the rabbi comes, okay, no, it's time for you to keep Shabbat. Yeah, but if it was good for me not to keep Shabbat, you said it was good. It was okay for me not to keep Shabbat for six months. You said it was okay. I'm, I'm new. I still feel like I'm new. I, I know I'm doing it for you. I still feel like I'm new. So another year passes. And another year, another year. And the next thing you know, the rabbi doesn't ask anymore. So 20 years go by, and he's still not keeping Shabbat. But he feels like he's a tzaddik, because he goes to shul. So that's why it's, it's not our responsibility uh, to decide for people what they can do, what they can't do. You tell them what God said, you tell them what is our responsibility, and you don't judge them if they can't do it, but you tell them, listen, this is where you need to aim towards. Be'ezat Hashem, you get to it soon. Personally, I don't believe that anyone in the world violates Shabbat knowingly. I think that anyone that violates Shabbat is either doing it because he doesn't realize what is the significance of Shabbat, or he just doesn't believe in God, even if he goes to shul, even if he learns Torah here and there, even if he goes to shul at Torah for 20 years. If he violates Shabbat, it's either because he doesn't believe the Torah is real, or he doesn't know the significance of Shabbat. Most people, it's because they don't know the significance of Shabbat. And the reason why I say that is because once you start learning about Shabbat, it's not all fun and games. Uh, Shabbat is the, you know, violating Shabbat is the worst sin in Judaism. It's worse than murder. It's worse than disobeying your parents. It's, uh, I mean, it's, I mean, you could give extreme examples, like, for example, a murderer that works for the mafia, and every day, six days a week, he murders people, but on Shabbat, he rests. He goes to the Beknesset, he eats chamin, <laughs> he, uh, you know, he has the family, wears a nice suit, doesn't shoot a gun, nothing. Doesn't drive, nothing. And then you have another guy, really, really nice guy, doesn't kill anybody, works at a bank, you know, and he gives people ATM cards. Really, really nice guy, but he drives to Shul on Shabbat. His punishment in Shemayim, a little banker that makes $50,000 a year, that has a very, very nice, calm life, his punishment is drastically worse, drastically, like comparison of here to the sun, drastically worse than the murderer every day. Why? Because the person that's keeping Shabbat is saying, listen, I have an evil inclination, I have a desire for money, each time I kill somebody, they pay me, the mafia pays me $25,000, the money means more to me than human life. Fine. But, I know that God created the heaven and earth, and I know eventually, you know, I'm going to have to pay the bill for this. But at least I'm going to live here. That's his mentality. The one that's not keeping Shabbat is pretty much telling, telling God, I don't believe in you. I don't believe you created the heaven and the earth in six days. I don't believe that, um, for in so many words, I don't believe you exist. And that's why in Yom Shishi, is, Hashem says to us that it's an eternal, eter, eternal uh, covenant. That he, that he created the world in six days which means that if we don't observe it, we don't believe He created the heaven and the earth in six days. We, you know, you can believe in anything else. And that's why 12 times that it mentions the punishment of Shabbat in the written Torah, the 12 times that it mentions it, every single time it mentions it right next to idol worship. Right next to people that, you know, buy a, a statue from uh, Chinatown and bow to it and think that somehow this statue that bought for $10 is going to give them money and give them uh, everything else they want. Stupid, right? But Hashem is comparing the idol worshiper to the person that's violating Shabbat. Same thing. In Hashem's eyes, the same exact thing. There's a lecture on my uh, YouTube I did in New York. Really interesting. goes in more in detail about the Shabbat versus idol worship. And why Hashem compares the two. Why every single time He mentions it, it's always, it's always one next to the other. Because to Him, it's the same exact thing. Someone violates Shabbat is the same thing as an idol worshiper. And that's why in Judaism, somebody that, uh, you know, in the Shulchan Aruch, in the Gemara, in the Zohar, in uh, the Red Torah, it's a, in all of them it says someone that violates Shabbat is not even considered Jewish. 
people have a hard time hearing this stuff because they believe that they're Jewish. Their mom was Jewish. They go to the, uh, you know, to the Beit Knesset a few times a year. They eat Jewish food. They tell everybody else, listen, I was born in Israel. You know, and so they feel Jewish. But according to the Torah, they're not Jewish. So when you tell people this, it's a wake-up call. Most of the time, it makes them want to change and hopefully change. Sometimes they fight a little bit and before they change. Sometimes they don't want to change and they just run away. But it's very, very rare. So if anyone says, listen, what about that? You know, let's say, for example, you have 10 people or even 10,000 people that out of all of them, you're going to have, let's say, 9,999 are going to listen and they're going to change over time. But one is going to lose. One is going to run away from you. You lost the Jew. It's a big sin. Lost the Jew. So this is where we go to a much, much smarter person than anyone else we have in the world, even if you combine all of the wisdom together, which we go to the Rambam. The Rambam, you know, as Sephardics, we go, we call ourselves Sephardics, not because we were born in, uh, in Spain. Most of us weren't. Some people were, but most of us weren't. The reason why Sephardics call themselves Sephardic is because all of the alachot, all of the rules that we have for the Sephardic people are based on his teaching, which he obviously got from the Torah. And since he lived in Spain for a period of time before he moved to, to Egypt, then we go after him. That's what we call ourselves Sephardic. So the Rambam says, if I'm going to give a talk and I'm going to say the words of truth, and that's all he said. He didn't tweet. It wasn't politically correct. <laughs> um, and I know that in a crowd of 10,000, I will lose 9,999. Lose them. They're all, they have no interest in listening to the truth. If anything, they'll go against me. But in that 10,000, I'll save one true soul. One person that wants to know the truth. This is the opposite of what I just said. I'm saying I'll, we'll save 9,999 and maybe lose one. He's saying, if I lose 9,999 just to save one, I'll do it all the time. I have no interest and no care in the world for those other 9,999. Why? Because the truth of Torah is the truth of Torah. It doesn't matter whether somebody agrees with it or doesn't agree with it. You know, it's like Hashem created it. Hashem, Hashem wrote it. Don't agree with it? Go fight with him. Go argue with him. So that's the thing that people need to understand. You can't worry about the future of he's going to like it, he's gonna, not going to like it, he's going to agree, he's not going to agree. It's not your business. You tell him the truth and let him, tell him decide for himself. And that's also one of the, to, to finalize that point, then we'll start the parasha. If you have two people, a doctor has two people. There's two people. One of them, you know, both of them are sick. Both of them are very, very sick. One of them, he tells the person, listen, you're sick, you have six months to live. Six months to a year you have to live. The other guy also has six months to 12 months, but he decides not to tell him. Which one is better off? The one he told that he's sick and he has only a year to live, or the one he didn't tell? Which one is better off? What do you think? He told one guy, he knows he's going to die in a year. The other one doesn't know. One day he's going to wake up, he's gonna, not going to wake up. So which, which one is better off? The one that doesn't know. Hold on, I'm checking the door. The one that doesn't know. The one that doesn't know is better off? Yeah. Why? Because he doesn't know. It's ignorant. He okay. doesn't know the truth. Okay, so he doesn't know the truth. Okay, so let's, let's, let's play this out. So if we have the guy that doesn't know, he's going to go to work every day. He's going to work at the bank. So we're still talking about the same banker. He's going to go work at the bank, and every day he's going to give out ATM, ATM cards. He's going to go to the bank, he's going to have ATM cards, he's going to do the accounting. He's going to work extra late because he has overtime to make because he wants to get his bonus this year. And one year passes. He spent all that year working extra, 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 extra. Barely even saw his family. And boom, he died. Mm -hmm. He didn't know he was going to die. He died after a year. But that whole year, he spent most of that time working. Barely had any time for his family or friends or loved ones. And he died. The other one knows. So do you think the other one's going to go to work for even one day? No. He's not going to go anywhere. He's going to go. He's going to go spend it with his loved ones. He's going to go on vacation. He's going to live life. 
going to go on vacation, he's going to hang out with the kids, he's going to play with the dog, he's going to hang out with the grandkids, he's not going to go to the bank. He's not going to do anything, he's going to enjoy life. Maybe he's going to pray to God. Makes sense. So he's better off that he knows, because he's going to occupy his time with something that he knows he has a limited amount of time. So when you have a limited amount of time, you want to do the things that you love most. You're not going to go work, you're not going to go care about the bills. And that's the thing, so when you tell somebody the truth, they're always better off. What they decide is not your business. Whether they decide to keep what Hashem said or not, it's not your business. What your business is, if you, if you know the truth, you tell somebody, you obviously try to do it in a nice way, in an educated way. If you can't do it, then you bring it to somebody that can. But nonetheless, it's not our job in this world to predict the future. And that's why I think, and I mention it often in Shulim, that it's a, it's a very, very common mistake that very, very smart people make. And, you know, the people that are making these mistakes, they're not fools. And if they spent even five minutes thinking about what we just said, they'd realize that it's a mistake. But most people just don't think about it. Sometimes the things that are most obvious are not things that you think about. In the beginning of Mesilat uh, Yesharim, Path of the Just, look, the Ram Chal says, I'm not here to teach you anything that you don't know. Most of what I say are things that you already know. I'm just here to remind you of all these things. But the reason why he wrote the book is not just to remind us. He says it's that these things are so simple, they're common sense. He's talking about midot and character traits. They're so simple that most people, that, even people that learn Torah, don't study them because they're simple. And people think it's just common sense. And if it's common sense, then that means that I'm going to do it. It's common sense that you shouldn't be cheap. It's common sense that you should be generous. It's common sense that you shouldn't be angry. It's common sense. But how come most of our friends and family are angry, cheap, or, 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 or some other extreme? It's common sense not to be. The fact that it's common sense is the reason why we don't think about it. Because people are saying, nah, it's so easy. Everybody knows you shouldn't be angry. So you don't. So you think that I don't need to study. Since I know that you shouldn't be angry, that means that I know how to not, not to be angry, which is completely wrong. Getting to a point where you never get angry requires work every single day and your character traits, if that's your difficulty that you have. requires you to work on anger every single day. How to get to a point not to get angry. And it's not like the secular medicine that they have today from psychiatrists where they tell you, listen, if uh, you know, next time your wife makes you upset, don't respond and just curse her in your heart. <laughs> and then eventually it'll go away and instead of uh, instead of beating up your kids just go punch a punching bag go get yourself a punching bag and beat up the bag and all these other ideas and if your wife doesn't want to be with you just get yourself a girlfriend but don't tell her about it and eventually she'll get the point. And they have all these crazy messages today. Sometimes they even advise couples that the way to fix the marriage is by them going with other people. I said, I'm not making this up. I, couldn't even, I, I wouldn't even be able to make something crazy like this up. But this is, what, this is what's happening in our world today. If you want to fix your marriage, maybe both of you should get like a boyfriend-girlfriend on the side and give each other a break. And this is the logic. Of, of, of secular medicine today. Yeah, that's, that's the advice that I've seen in TV. Yeah. Oh, even TV. Oh, even TV. Yeah. Yeah, they advise you to get a, you know, girlfriend. Get a girlfriend and a on the boyfriend side. And, you know, finally they will come up again. Yeah, yeah. So, this, this type of advice is not only not helpful, it's, it's destructive. And one example with the person that's angry, if the person does not get to, is continuously angry, and now instead of taking out his energy on his kids or his wife, he's taking it on a punching bag, or he's keeping it inside, okay, that may work for a little while, and he may not beat up his kids for a while, and he may not, uh, you know, yell at his wife, but eventually, he's still keeping all of this anger, and if anything, now that he's able to express all of his anger on this bag, if anything, he's developing even more anger, he's just projecting it a different way, but one day is going to come, where that bag is not going to be available because he's going to be in a car or he's going to be in the office or he's going to be in the mall. The bag's not going to be there and he's going to be really, really angry. And now that he's trained his anger so much and built it up, 
he's going to have to express it in some way or another. And that's why you have people that lose their mind start shooting up places, go up to, go to, the, uh, to the post office and start shooting people. Or kill, kill their family one day. Every day everything looks great, and one day they just kill everyone. People just lose their mind. And it's, not, and it's all the doctor's fault. It's not the person's fault. You just listen to the advice of the doctor. Because that advice is flawed. He's not helping you with anger. He's, if anything, he's, telling, he's showing you a way of how you can hide it and slowly but surely make it even worse. So if you want to work on your anger, you have to learn how not to be angry at all. Not how to control your anger, but how not to be angry. And the way to do it in a simple way, obviously this requires a lot more than what I say, the way to do it is to realize that you really have no reason whatsoever to ever be angry. The Ramban writes in a letter, he gave it to Ramban, he writes to his, uh, to his son at the end of his life that when a person gets angry, all types of Gehenom are controlling him. The worst evil there is, is is taking control of the person. If you've ever seen a person you've known for a long time, you're used to him, he's a nice person, generous, funny, da. But then one day you saw that person, her or him, angry, and it's a completely different person. One day they're nice, they're generous, they're great, next thing you know, they're taking a chair and smashing it over somebody's head. It's not, it's two different people. Because when somebody loses, loses their, uh, you know, their patience and gets to a point where they get really, really angry, it's, it's mamash becomes a, uh, a completely different person. So when we learn how there's never really a reason to ever be angry because everything that happens to us is dictated by the one above. It's not dictated by us. Once we realize that everything that's happened around us has nothing to do with us, Yes, of course, certain things are the outcome of our own actions. Of course, if you hang out in a dangerous neighborhood and somebody beats you up, it's your fault. It's not, the, it's not God's fault. You put yourself in that situation. If you hang out with a bunch of people that are thieves and one of them ends up stealing your money, it's your fault. It's not God's fault. We have to also realize that if we put ourselves in a dangerous situation, then the rules don't apply. But in a normal circumstance, if... We realize that Hashem decides everything that's happening to us, decides the pluses, the minuses. When He sends us tests, it's because He loves us and He's trying to bring us higher. So when He sends us somebody that's going to upset us, it's because He wants us to learn how not to be upset and how we don't have a reason to be upset so we could develop patience so eventually we could deal and even help people like that. When He sends us money problems, it's only because He wants to hear our prayer and he wants us to get to a point where we realize that he's the only one that's going to give us sustenance. He's, only, he's the only one that's going to decide how much money we're going to get. And it's not up to us. So whether we work 40 hours a week or 80 hours a week, our income is going to be exactly the same. So all of these things are tough for us to naturally understand because we're used to something that's completely different. We're used to the secular medicine that we get. We're used to the TV show telling us that we should get a girlfriend on the side along with the wife and kids. <laughs> That's what we're used to. Exactly. So you turn on the TV and you see Dr. Oz and Dr. Phil and Dr. whoever else is popular. I tell you, listen, do this, do this, do this, do this. All of them go against the Torah. Someone's homosexual, let's give him a show. Someone is a, uh, leaves his family, but he uh, there's a disastrous story I heard just in the past uh, week or two. I said it yesterday's show, but it's, it's enough of a... Uh, uh, it shook me up enough that I have to repeat it again, because just to remind myself of what kind of world we were living in. A guy who's married for, I don't know, maybe at least 15 or 20 years, seven kids, at uh, his late uh, 40s or even early 50s, decided that he doesn't want to be a father to his kids, doesn't want to be a wife to it doesn't want to be a husband to his wife what he does want to be is a seven-year-old girl so he decided that he's going to be a seven-year-old girl he left his family and now he dresses like a seven-year-old girl and he adopted two old old couple that adopted him and now they're his fake parents and he's playing with toys all day now instead of sending someone like this to a mental institution they, give, they put him on prime time television. 
They give a whole special about this person, and one TV show is interviewing him, and another one, and another one, and it's all over the internet. That's how I found out about it. I don't watch TV, but it's on the internet. It's, 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 it's mind-boggling. So instead of putting you know, this, a person like this that's that crazy, okay, put him in some cage or something. I don't know. This, this person belongs in a mental institution. But instead, they highlight this, this world that we live in are highlighting people like this and giving them credit and people are sending them letters. Oh, good for you for telling the truth. Good for you for being yourself. Being yourself? Well, you're not a seven-year-old. What yourself? Seven-year-old girl? What seven-year-old? People are just crazy. And it, all he really, in reality, people like that, all they want is attention. That's really Well, that's, uh, we recently had uh, this uh, Kardashian uh, mm -hmm. show in which uh, this uh, gentleman becomes a lady. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now he's even more famous than before. Exactly. And he's making tons of money just because of, there is a lot of... Craziness. People. So that's, exactly. that's why, that's when the Gemara, the sages say, Alma de Shikra, this is the world of lies. Everything is the opposite in this world. So when you realize that these very same people are getting highlighted and credited and money and all of this stuff, and it's obviously wrong for anyone that has 2% common sense realizes something wrong with these people. They should, they should be put in a cage, not, not highlighted on television. So you realize that the advice we're getting from the secular world is obviously wrong. It's obvious not just against the Torah, it's against human logic. This is Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm -hmm. So we realize that we can't listen to any of it. We have to go to the manufacturer... We have to go to the Creator that wrote instructions. He told us how to live, live life. The Torah is not just a book of stories. The Torah is advice of how to live, a fulfilling life, how to be happy, how to be successful in business, how to be successful in marriage, how to be successful as a parent, how to be successful as a partner, how to do everything the best you possibly can and get reward for all of it. That's the best part about it. Every day in the morning, we wake up, every normal human being washes his hands, washes his face. God says, you know what, I love you so much that if you just remember me when you do it, and you do it a certain way, where you wash one here, one there, one here, one there, three times on each hand, not only are you doing everything you're going to do anyway, but you get a reward for it. A reward that you can't even compare to anything material in this world. Just for washing your hands once. That's it, just washing your hands once. One person came, I believe it was to the Baal Shem Tov, and this poor, poor person comes to the Baal Shem Tov and he says, Kodarav, I'm very, very poor. I'm thinking, you know, you speak to, you have a direct contact with Hashem, maybe you could pray to Hashem for me and tell him, listen, all the schut, all the reward that I'm going to get for doing tefillin, just for one day. I know it's big tefillin, I can't, not for my whole life, but just for one day, Instead of the schut that I'm going to get, instead of the reward that I'm going to get for the tefillin for today, just give me some money. Instead. The Baal Shem Tov says to him, he goes, do you think I'm a thief? No, no, Kodarab, what thief? I'm asking you for your help. Because you're not asking me for, for help, you're asking me to be a partner in a crime, a partner in a, in a highway robbery. He goes, how? How am I asking you to do that? He says, if somebody had a coin, a very, very special coin, and one day his kid took the coin, and uh, the coin is very special, it's worth millions of dollars. And the kid, the little, little five-year-old kid, took the coin, doesn't know it's worth a lot of money, and he gave it to the store clerk. Obviously, everybody with common sense as an adult knows this coin is worth a lot of money. Maybe they don't know it's worth millions, but they know it's worth a lot of money. They know it's not ten cents. They know it's not one dollar. And the store clerk says, what do you want, kid? Oh, no, I want a Snickers bar. And he takes the coin for the Snickers bar, knowing that this coin is worth a lot more than what it says on the coin. Now, is this store clerk, is he a thief or not? He goes, yeah, of course he's a thief. Well, he knows the coin is worth a lot more money. He goes, that's what you're asking me. He goes, how am I doing? I call that up. He says, you're thinking that your mitzvah of tefillin is something that you can compare to anything material in this world. He goes, the amount of reward that you're going to get just for one day of tefillin is more good than it's available for every human being combined in this world that they're ever going to have. Just for one day of tefillin. 
So for me to tell you, to give you a little bit of money, there's not enough money in the world for God to give you for just one day of tefillin. So I can't, I can't be part of this robbery. I can't tell you that it's okay for you to give your schud of tefillin for what? What do you want? $500 a week? $1,000 a week? That, you're not even asking for millions. You're asking for just some bread. Don't worry. It's in Perkat Amazon every day we read Perkat Amazon, we eat bread. King David tells us, I've been young and I've been old. And I've never seen a righteous person starve or his kids begging for change. No such thing. If you do God's will, Hashem is not going to let you starve. Of course, there are times you're going to be going through difficulties. But there's no such thing as a righteous person that starves. Just tests. And Hashem tests us in order for us to elevate ourselves. Now, in this week's parasha, we have a lot of these, uh, a lot of these amazing stories. But Hashem, we did a shiur about it last night. So uh, the interesting part is, when we do a shiur here, we also do it about parashat Shavua, But I try to do a completely different shiur, and I know that uh, Fidel <coughs> tests me also, so it's good. He keeps me on my toes. <laughs> So, in the beginning of the shul, it talks, in essence, it gives us a message of everything we just talked about in just one sentence where it says, Yaakov Mitzrayim Sheva Shana Yaakov Shnei Chayav Sheva Shanim Ve'arbaim Shana Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. In the days of Jacob, the years of his life were 147 years. Now, why do I say this sentence means so much? Because, in essence, he's telling you that Jacob is ending his life. And now Jacob is trying to close all of the accounts. He's trying to make sure that before he leaves this material world, he finalizes the things that he needs to finalize. And obviously when someone gets to that time where they know they're going to die, they realize that, you know, they start looking at their life. What have I done in my life? Has it been worthwhile? Is chasing all this money worth it? Is chasing a new girlfriend every week worth it? is uh, doing, uh, you know, uh, spending all of my time uh, doing things that are uh, good for my ego, but bad for my, uh, you know, bad for my, my overall life, worth it. You start evaluating your life. Now, obviously, Yankov, there was not a day he didn't spend just thinking about Hashem constantly doing mitzvot. But even he, when Pao asked him, how many years and days have you lived in this world? And he says, less than my father's. He considered himself less than Avraham and Yitzchak. Even though technically, there's some that say he's even more. That also shows you the, the midat of Anava, the humility that he had in him. So the first thing that he says, here after the night, he calls his son Yos, uh, Joseph, Yosef, and he asks Yosef to make a swear. You need to swear to me that you're going to not bury me in Egypt here. You're going to bury me in Canaan, which is eventually going to be Israel. You have to swear to me. Why is he making him swear? Because he knows that Paro and all of Egypt looked, look at not just Joseph, but look at Yaakov as a very, very unique person. As soon as he came to Egypt to join his son, the famine stopped. There was supposed to be a famine for seven years. The famine was only for two years by the time he came. And as soon as he gave the blessing to Paro, the famine stopped. So you see, this is not a regular person. And there was a lot of blessings since the day he came. And he's, uh, you know, a very old, wise man. So he knew that the Egyptians idol worshipped everything they can they could find. Whether it was the river they wanted to idol worship, or the animals they wanted to idol worship, or Paro himself they wanted to idol worship. So this person, they knew that if he dies... They're going to find out that he is not only not like them, but he's above what's normal. Why? Because a, a righteous person, his body doesn't disintegrate. You know, human body, after somebody dies, after three days, not only does it, it start smelling really, really bad, but also the body starts to disintegrate. Worms and all that stuff, you know, and after about approximately about a year, it's just bones. This scientific proof of this today, it's not just something that is written in the Torah, this is proven. Righteous people, they've dug up their graves, sometimes accidentally, sometimes intentionally because they want to move them to a better area, for many reasons. But they've opened graves. Sometimes they didn't even know the person was a righteous person. 
and they open the grave and they see the person looks literally like, he, like he just, he's just sleeping, like he died yesterday. And this is three, four, five, six hundred years later, a thousand years later. So not like, uh, okay, it was last week, so okay, he lasted more than three days. A righteous person, a truly, truly righteous person, a tzaddik, that never had jealousy in his life, his body doesn't disintegrate. Yaakov knew that he was such a person. Even though he was very, very humble, he was humble next to Hashem, but next to mankind. He knew where he stood. So he knew that if he dies in, a, uh, in Egypt, they had the custom of mummifying people. So eventually they're going to see that when uh, he also knew that the, uh, the, the plagues are going to come to Egypt, and when they see that the lice plague comes to Egypt, does not affect his body, and they see that his body has not been affected for hundreds of years, they're going to really, this person is, a, uh, is above human. They're going to start idol-worshipping him. They're going to turn him into an idol worship. He doesn't want that. He doesn't want anyone worshipping him. He wants people to worship God. And that's also one of the mistakes that we have in our generation, unfortunately, is that people got to a point where they've turned rabbis, current and past rabbis, into actual idols. Uh, this is unfortunate because these rabbis, if they were alive today and they saw this, they would be more angry about uh, at their own students than uh, I think even Hashem. Because people have you know these righteous people, you know whether it's the Lubavitch rabbi from uh, from Chabad or the uh, you know other others that have died in the past, that uh, you know these are really really big tzaddikim. But unfortunately, some of their students didn't exactly pay attention in all the classes. And after they died, they started idol-worshipping these people. They started pretty much getting to teaching people or telling people that in order for you to get to God, you have to go through this Rebbe, which is against the 13 principles of faith, of Judaism. It's outright idol-worship. This is what Christianity is. Right. When Christianity tells you, you have to, in order to reach God, you have to get to this J.C. Penny guy. The reality of it is, <laughs> it's idol worship. That's true. <laughs> it's idol worship. Some say he's God himself, whatever. The point is that it's 100% idol worship. Whether it's a rabbi, or it's a different religion, or it's a cow, or it's a, uh, a statue. It's idol worship. Now, obviously, most people, you tell them, oh, you know, you tell a Christian person, listen, you're idol worshiping, they think you're crazy. You have to show them that what they're doing is idol worship. You have to explain it to them. You tell a, a religious Jew that by him praying to this rabbi instead of praying to God, they're idol worshiping. In the beginning, it's going to be very, very difficult for people to accept it. Many people don't accept it. But it's 100% idol worship. And this is the main thing that Yaakov was very worried about anybody ever idol worshiping him. And also, it got to a point where Hashem did not tell anybody where Moses was, was buried. He's the only one, we, really, we don't know where he's buried. Hashem, is the, Hashem buried Moses himself. He's the only one in history where Hashem buried him. Hashem didn't bury Yaakov, Hashem didn't bury Abraham, or Isaac, or Aaron, or anyone else. I don't remember any other person that Hashem buried himself, even King David. Hashem didn't bury him. The only person he ever buried in history was Moses. Why? Because he knew that if Moses, if people knew where Moses was buried, not only the Jews, all the Goim, all the non-Jews would turn him into an idol. Right. He's the only person that spoke to God face to face, face, to face, spoke to him like you and I speaking to each other right now. There's nobody like that. Even, even, even uh, uh, Abraham, Jacob, Isaac, Adam, all of the others, they spoke to Hashem also, but not in the same level as, as Moses. Not in the same level. Everyone else that spoke to Hashem spoke to him either through some type of dream, meditation. They were all laying down. They weren't, or sitting down. The only one that spoke to him standing up, meaning awake, was Moses. So, Hashem knew that the, he created humans. He knows human nature. He knows if I tell people where he's buried, he's going to turn him into an idol. And he's, instead of enjoying Gan Eden, he's going to be suffering. Knowing that he spent his entire life just to serve me, and now the, the outcome of all of, his, all of his mitzvot has turned into something that I detest. It's an abomination, people doing idol worship. One question that is very, very good to ask and answer is, why does God hate idol worship so much? I remember we said before, I know that during the shiur, before the shiur, we said that the uh, idol worship and 
violation of Shabbat is the same thing. So, question is, why does Hashem hate idol worship so much? Anybody, you have any idea? So, the reason is, one of the reasons, is that Hashem, obviously we're saying, you know, He wrote the Torah, He created the, you know, heaven and the earth, everything in between, everything above and below, things we know about, things we don't know about. He doesn't think like us, He doesn't look like us, He doesn't have an image, or anything resembling an image. He has no limitations. He's not bound to time. He's everything. According to the Zohar, technically he is everything and there's nothing else other than him, including you, me, and uh, the closet and the walls and the house and the world and the cosmos. And everything is technically Hashem. There is nothing else other than him. So he is everything. Right? What's an idol? Do you, do you, when you think of an idol... Material. You think of something material. You think of something, uh, you know, a little statue that somebody bought from, uh, you know, from a store... You know, it's somebody made it in a machine or out of a piece of wood or a piece of metal. Somebody made it. So when someone is idol worshipping, they're replacing everything, the one that created everything, with the creation of one of his creations. So it's not even that they're replacing the creator with his creation. They're, they're replacing the creator with the creation's creation. So it couldn't be farther. It's the farthest point. It's everything with nothing. With nothing. Exactly. So there couldn't be more disrespect to God. It's the worst version of disrespect that you can have. You're replacing everything with nothing. And that's why God says to, to the prophets, He says, your nation replaced me from well, um, oceans of water with little uh, holes that they are looking for water. Maybe it's going to have some water, maybe not. Now, oceans of water would never end. They're replacing it with little pots of water. What are they replacing it with? And that's what people need to understand. Idol worship is not a uh, God is a jealous God. People think that he's jealous of the, of the, uh, of the statue. You know, when it says God's a jealous guy, it doesn't mean he's jealous of this statue. The statue is nothing. It's that people were placing one of this. It couldn't be a bigger sign of disrespect. So, when someone says, okay, this is, I understand, it's easy to understand. Why God would be upset at you replacing him with nothing. So, the other thing that we need to understand is that idol worship is not relevant to most Jews. It's not relevant to even most people in the world that, uh, you know, understand what, what even the concept of God is. Even though people... Make, you know, most people are doing idol worship are doing it by mistake. Very few are doing it intentionally. And even once they learn that it's a problem, even Christians, you tell them, listen, your religion is idol worship, they, many of them stop following Christianity and they start becoming Noahites. Oh, Hashem, we've helped a few of them and uh, start learning. You know, they believe in the Torah and they never knew and never even thought about how Christianity has turned God into a human that's complete idol worship. So now... When you tell people this, and they love God, they love the truth, they follow it. It's an easy transition. That's also why the Rambam says the reason why God allowed Christianity and Islam to be created, because technically these two religions gave us more problems than anybody else. You know, Islam didn't, the, the problems with Islam didn't just start today, which unfortunately was more murders in Jerusalem today. A rabbi was killed. Yeah. And these terrorists are shining. Uh, rabbi. Oh, Argentinian was? Yeah, it's Argentinian. Uh, that's something tragic. Every day, new tragedy. Every day, new tragedy. So these are shining, these wicked people that think that they're following the word of God, which according to the book of Daniel, the they will get the bigger biggest punishment, even though their um, war against the Jews and the uh, persecution of the Jews is actually less than what the Christians have done and the Catholics have done to the Jews throughout history. They, the uh, the uh, fanatic Islam, is going to get a much bigger punishment, much much bigger punishment. And the reason why is because they're using God's name uh, to mm -hmm. justify their actions. So now, so you ask yourself, why did God even allow these two religions to be born? 
before them, there was either Judaism or pagan. You either worship God or you worship statues or a star or a uh, something like that. So, why did God allow this? I mean, they gave us so much problems. The uh, Holocaust is not the beginning. It's not the end. What's happening today is not the beginning or the end. We've had the you know, things that have happened throughout all of history. Why do we allow this to happen? The Rambam says it's because this got the pagans one step closer to the truth. It got them from being pagans to at least the perception of, for Christianity, the perception of one God, monotheism, and for Islam, monotheism, even though they don't follow the, uh, the rules of God, and they've created some of their own. Nonetheless, they're still monotheistic. They still believe in God. If you, if somebody was running away from an enemy, and they had to hide somewhere, and you have several choices. One choice is church. Another choice is a reform shul, reform synagogue. And another choice is a mosque. Where can you hide? Seems like an obvious question, right? <laughs> Reform synagogue, church, full of crosses and, and Jesus this and Jesus that. And then you have Muhammad and his buddies in the mosque. Where can you hide? Enemies coming. Guys, you have to wake up. The, guy, the, the enemy is going to catch you. In the form? No. What do you think? Well, I, I will say reform. Okay. What do you think? Because if you go to other, you know, places, that, you know... It's not pagan. No, we just said Allah, Allah is the same God as us. A Muslim exactly. is the same God as us. It's not pagan. That's, believe it or not, that's the answer. Musk is the only place you're allowed to hide in. Musk is the only place you're allowed to hide in. Why musk? We already know Christianity, the church, you're not allowed because it's pagan, because it's idol worship. Right. Musk, we know you're allowed to hide because Allah is the same God as us. You just call him Allah. Mm -hmm. Just like you say God, you say, you know, there's several names for, for Hashem. It means the same thing. Why not reform shul? Because reformed have changed the religion even more so than the Christians did. So much so that it's you're not even allowed to walk in. It's worse than that. It's it's the highest it's the, it's the worst desecration of Hashem's name there is. Um, you're not even allowed to walk in. They give a bar mitzvah to dogs. They marry men and men. The uh, rabbis are women. Yeah. These are all things that are against the Torah. Giving a bar mitzvah to a dog, marrying men and men. These things are against the Torah. They're changing scripture. With Christianity, at least they had some respect for our scripture. They're lying with, with their new book, but nonetheless, they say, listen, the first book is your first book. It's, it's our first book. We have the same first book. It's just that we say we have a second book. And it's a continuation. Okay, second book contradicts the first, but they don't. They do it discreetly. And most Christians, if you, if you, if you talk to them, most people... You know, they believe that the Old Testament, that the Torah is real. Unfortunately, you just never read it. Why? Because the church is not going to teach them the Old Testament. It's right. going to teach them the New Testament. Why? Because if anyone that learns the Old Testament is going to realize the New Testament is complete garbage. Right. So, no, very few people actually ever read the Old Testament. That's why anyone that actually spends extra time, it's Christian, spends extra time reading the actual Tanakh and really studying it like, you know, a kosher translation, not a Christian translation, a kosher one from rabbis that know it to Hebrew. It's very, very quick that you find out that there's something wrong with Christianity. It says it outright. You're not allowed to have a tree in the house. In multiple places, in Jeremiah, in the, in the, in the Rin Torah, and it's, it's all over the place. God says you're not allowed to have a tree. Celebrate a tree. Put a uh, Christmas tree in your house. Not allowed to do it. It's idol worship. It's outright a verse. It's not like a translation or an interpretation. It outright says you're not allowed to have and celebrate these trees. You're not allowed to put them in your, in your house. What do they do every year? They put a Christmas tree. People think, oh, it's nice. People, unfortunately, that are in reform schools, they tell people to get Hanukkah trees. I know. Hanukkah trees. Hanukkah trees. I haven't seen that. Oh, yeah. Type Hanukkah trees on Google. You'll see millions of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Mamash, it's, it's far, it's far, very far. When you start changing the rules, there's no end. No, no, no. So, but at least with them, you can say, listen, they obviously made mistakes, there's a problem, but nonetheless, they say, you know what, your first book is real, we're not changing your first book, we just say we have a second book. With the reform, they're just saying that the first book is the only book, but it's not relevant anymore, so we're just going to write a new one along the way, whenever, whatever's convenient for us. No, God made a mistake here, God made a mistake there, <laughs> and they're pretty much judging God. No, God made mistakes. If God made mistakes, then he's not God. That's a, you know, human people. Right. So that's, that's, that's the problem. So uh, people don't understand that when you start changing the rules, even one, even the smallest rule, even the smallest rule, you can't change. Even if there was a custom that has chazaka, meaning that it's around for many, many years. Like, for example, the, uh, the Ashkenazis, they don't eat rice on Pesach. Now, technically, rice is not chametz. It's not chametz. You're allowed to eat, to eat Sephardic, eat, eat uh, rice on Pesach. But the Ashkenazis don't eat rice. And even, I think, Moroccans also don't eat rice. Um, but the Ashkenazis don't eat rice because somewhere around four or 500 years ago, the people, most people were poor. And they would reuse the sacks for that they had wheat, and barley also for rice. So they never knew if there was even a, you know, a few grains of the non-kosher with something that's kosher. So they said, listen, since we're using, reusing the sack, we have no guarantee that our rice is kosher. There could be one grain of chametz in here. It's a big avera. Somewhere eats chametz on Pesach. It's karet. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a small... Uh, it's not something that's no big deal. It's not like you forgot to do the Tilati Daim in the morning. It's a big deal. So he said, no, we're not risking it. So from now on, we're not allowed to eat rice on, uh, on Pesach. Now, of course, today, they don't, no one reuses sacks. No one even uses the same plastic bag anymore. But since it's been around for so many years, so many centuries, you don't change the rule. And this is not even Allah So, of course, if you don't change something that's a custom for so many years, of course, you're not going to change an Allah You're not going to change a rule. So when you have reforms, changing the rules and, and trying to give you know, credit and, and celebrating homosexuality, uh, celebrating giving, uh, putting tefillin on dogs, mm -hmm. celebrating things that are outright against the Torah, abominate. You can see this stuff on YouTube. I don't make any of this stuff up. You can see bar mitzvah for dog. You'll see a dog with tefillin on its head. Mm -hmm. A real tefillin, not like a plate tefillin. Real tefillin. Yes. But that's on reforms uh, uh, shoes. Reform shoes. So, it's a problem. Uh, and that's, that's, when you get to that point, when you start changing the rules, there's no limitations. And uh, that it originally reforms was not supposed to be like it. It wasn't like it was today. It wasn't like it was today. Originally, it was just the, the head rabbi said that, you know what, maybe we should give uh, our kids secular education, not just focus on yeshivas. Maybe we should just send them to have secular education, send them to universities. This is somewhere around two or three hundred years ago. And I'll be the example. I'll send all ten of my children to universities. In his life, God punished them by making, by showing them what the outcome of what his action is going to be. Every one of his ten boys married a non-Jew. Every one of his ten boys completely left Judaism altogether. This is a rabbi. And two hundred, you know, so this is one rule change. Less Torah. A few generations later, listen, you're allowed to drive on Shabbat. A little more time, your dog should get a bar mitzvah also. Why should you disrespect the dog? A little more time let pass. Why is it a problem if a rabbi is openly gay? I mean, it says, it only says, God says it multiple times that it's pretty much the worst possible sin you can make and it's an abomination. But, no, God made a mistake. He's not, uh, he doesn't know our times. <laughs> so that's the problem. That's the problem. People need to understand these things. And unfortunately, most people are not educated. They're not educated about this thing. And uh, conservative also has a similar problem. Conservative is, it used to be, conservative in the past, conservative shuls, used to be what orthodox is today. Used to be. Today, they're getting closer and closer to reform, unfortunately. And it's a problem. And it's not a, uh, it's not, and the funny thing is, is that most of the people that go to conservative shuls want to practice. They want to do more. If you tell them, listen, you, you can't drive on Shabbat. Listen, 
You can't eat everything you want. But you got to do this. You got to do. This. If you tell them, they'll do it. But when they have somebody that calls themselves a rabbi, tell them, listen, you're allowed to do this. You're allowed to break this rule, break that rule, break that rule. They don't have time to learn to all these people. They don't know the significance of it, so they just follow what the rabbi says. And they think that they're being kosher. They think that they're doing great. This one guy uh, sent a question in. A woman uh, sent a question in. My son is, I'm trying to get him a, uh, I'm trying to, you know, we've been keeping Shabbat. Uh, but he has, a, he's going to university. And uh, the his, his uh, professor says that he has to take a test on Shabbat. His finals has to be on Shabbat. I told him he can't come to uh can't come to uh, school on Shabbat, can't come to university on Shabbat. And the professor is such an anti-Hashem person. He says, no, no, I spoke to the woman rabbi in, at my local shul, the woman rabbi, so obviously this is a reform shul. Yeah. And she knows a lot more Torah than you, so you're allowed to come take a test on Shabbat. So if you don't come, I'm going to fail you. This is, this is a very difficult test. Of course, he's not allowed to go take this test. Let him fail the test, and he should even leave the school. But nonetheless, it's a very, very difficult test for a 17, 18-year-old kid. And that's the problem. So when you change the Torah, there's no end to the damage that you make. And what's happening also with, with reform is that little by little, they're changing the rules. The head rabbi of this, people need to know this, head rabbi of conservative uh, shul, conservative organization in general in Jerusalem is openly gay. This was a, he became head rabbi about a year and a half ago. Head rabbi of conservative movement in Jerusalem is openly gay. This is a problem. This is pretty much your, when, when you're, okay, if he's, if he's in the closet and no one knows, no one knows. But when you're celebrating this, you're saying, no, not only is he openly gay, but he, we just made him president. It's almost part of our decision was made because he's that, to show how open-minded we are. You're outright going to war with Hashem. You're saying that it's okay. That Hashem made a mistake in the Torah, Chash Shalom. So these are things that people need to understand that it's, it, it becomes a serious problem once you break one of these rules. And that's why I tell people, listen, if you have one of two choices, you have one of these non-kosher shuls or no shul. Don't go to shul. You're not obligated to go to shul. You're obligated to pray. You're obligated to do the mitzvot. You're obligated to keep Shabbat. You're obligated to keep kosher. You're obligated to do all of those things, but you're not obligated to go to shul. Especially if the shul is not kosher, don't go to shul. Why would you go to shul? So again, this is not necessarily telling people, listen, we should uh, go to war with all of our friends and, and do things like that. You should tell your friends the truth, and just like we talked about, people that learn the truth more times than not will want to do the right thing. Most people that are making these mistakes don't want to make these mistakes. You know, they don't know, listen, they, uh, I didn't know that this uh, shul uh, gives uh, bar mitzvahs to dogs on weekends. I didn't know <laughs> on Sundays. I didn't know. I don't come here on Sundays. You know, you don't, so you ask. You ask around. What is this? What are we? What's this? You ask questions. And, and, and little by little, if you, tell, if you have a small shul, 50, 30, 40 people, even if it's conservative, you can tell the rabbi, listen, we don't want to be conservative anymore. If you get enough people in the congregation to do it, you can change. Listen, we're ready for the next step. You know, we, uh, we don't, you, don't need, you no longer need to make the decision for us and tell us we're allowed to break all these rules because in reality, according to the Torah, we're not allowed to break anything. There's no such thing as a uh, half-fast uh, uh, Judaism. So again, these things are difficult tests. Nonetheless, I know it's not easy. I know it's... A, um, it's, it's a major change, all of the things that we're talking about for people here, people that are watching, but the reward is endless. The rewards are endless. And when we think that, hey, listen, you know, maybe if I don't do this, but I'll do it somewhere down the road. I'll do it somewhere down the road. It's the same type of mentality where someone says, listen, I don't have, uh, you know, I'm not going to put enough money for retirement. Now, I'll do it once I get a little older. Problem is, once you get a little older, you, f you realize that you forgot to, make, to save any money for retirement, and you realize that you have to work your whole life. So there's no such thing as planning for leaves. Just certain things, if it's the truth, truth is more important than everything else. 
And that's that's the main thing that we learn just in the, just literally the beginning of this parasha, we learn that when Yaakov and the sages, when he talks about the end of their life, the most important messages that they gave is at the end of their life. The whole book of Deuteronomy, the last book of the Torah, is completely rebuking Am Yisrael. Moses wrote this book. And God asked him to add it to the first four books that God wrote. And the fourth book, you see Moses rebuking the nation, reminding them of all of their countless mistakes, reminding them of the ten tests that they tested God. Not God tested them, they tested God. Imagine this, you saw God's voice. You heard his voice. When we were at Mount Sinai, the voice was so extreme that every single person died and was brought back to life twice. They heard, they heard the first two commandments. Each time they heard the commandments and the voice of God, they died. Well, everyone died. Millions and millions of people died. God brought them back. Second commandment, everyone died. God brought them back. Then they told me. They felt this. It's not dying is not like it's a you're going to sleep. They felt this. That's what they told Moses. Listen, we can't take it anymore. We can't take it. We can't hear his voice. If we hear his voice, we're gonna die. They know, because they died already. That's why he said we're gonna die if we hear his voice. Because they died already. You go talk to him, whatever, whatever he tells you, just tell us we'll do it. Not seven Ishma. We'll do it, and then we'll hear it. Whatever he wants. Just, we can't hear his voice anymore. It's too scary. Imagine that. And he says, no, God's not here to scare you. He loves you. He's testing you if you really love him. So imagine this. They tested these very same people. Every one of them became a prophet. The, the lowest level was a bigger prophet than Ezekiel. The last prophets we had. The lowest one, the lowest level at Mount Sinai was bigger than one of the biggest prophets in history that we have a book about. It. And they tested God. Obviously, in their own level, and there's the different level of Yetzirah, but nonetheless, they tested God. So Moses knows what he's dealing with here. Moses is saying that the entire, pretty much the entire book of Deuteronomy is rebuking the nation, to reminding them of how they tested God, how they questioned God, how they didn't have enough emunah in God, how he gave them everything and they didn't necessarily return what they were supposed to. Question his, question his, his sincerity over and over and he told them the rules. Parashat Bechukotai. Parashat Bechukotai and Kitavot. These are two very, very difficult parashot. Some shuls don't read them out loud. You know, in Shabbat you read the parashot out loud. Some shuls don't read them out loud. Big sections of those parashot don't read them out loud. You know why? Because the sections are those two parashot that are curses. Yeah. Hashem yeah. says, Hashem says, it's very common. It's not just, uh, it's not It's not one congregation or two, it's most. Yeah, yeah. Do, do it in a low voice. Yeah, low, low voice. Low, low, low voice. Low, low. Yeah. In the old days, by the way, just to show you the difference, uh, you'll see the synagogue I go to, same thing. Uh, and most synagogues are like that. In the old days, where they were much, much more religious than our generation, and obviously there's some places around the you know around the world still that are that religious and, and do it. Not only was it not in a low voice, it was an extra loud voice. The opposite of what we do today. Why? Because Hashem wrote it because He wants us to know. Not so we whisper it. He said He gave you the blessing and the curse. Why the blessing and the curse? Because there's no one without the other. It's a package deal. You do what's right, you get the blessing. You do what's wrong, you get the curse. There's no such thing as, if I don't do anything, I don't get anything. If I don't do anything, if I don't do any mitzvot, then I don't get anything. I don't get a blessing, I don't get a curse. No, no, it's no such thing. That's what people make a mistake about free choice. People always think about, we have free choice. Rabbi Mizrahi talks about it in the lectures. Maybe it's in one of the discs that I you know, left here for you guys. And he talks about free choice. It really not, doesn't exist. There's no such thing as free choice. There's choice, but not free choice. What does it mean, choice? Our free choice, we believe that we can do whatever we want, and the outcomes are going to be what the outcomes are. So, for example, if I go to work, 
the guy will pay me $100. If I don't go to work, he won't pay me anything. That's what we believe free choice is. God tells us we don't have such a thing. We have choice, not free choice. What does that mean? If, we, if I go to work, I get $100. If I don't go to work, the boss sends somebody to my house and beats, beats me up all day. Not only do I not get paid, but I get beat up. That's the curse. That's not free choice. No. That's choice. Yeah. So it's either you get good or you get bad. There's not, no middle. And that's what God is telling us in those two parashot. It's blessing and the curse. So the key is that if you already know it's the blessing and the curse, and you hear it in Beknesset, you realize, okay, you know what? Curse, not worth it for me to get beat up. I don't want to get beat up. So let me do the blessing. See, it's an easy decision. All I need to know is just know what it is. What I need, what do I need to, where do I sign up? If I get a blessing for all these things, why not? Wash, wash my hands in a, you know, this uh, tool to wash my hands, I get a blessing, great, okay. I do wrap this thing around my arm every morning, I get a blessing, great. Do a small blessing before I eat, after I eat also. What's the big deal? It's not so far, it's not so difficult. It's not as difficult as people make it to be. Our Yetzirah makes it seem like it's the most difficult thing in the world, but in reality it's not that difficult. So that's why God says it's so easy that if you think it's difficult, it's not my Torah. One of the sages tells a story. He says to one of the people, he says, uh, listen, I uh, left my uh, bag and some place, if you could please go get me the bag. What does your bag look like? It's black, it has a stripe, da 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 da. It gives him a description. The guy goes and gets the bag, and the rabbi sees him, and he sees dragging the bag. It's really, really heavy for him. He's dragging it on the. He's struggling, he's sweating. And the rabbi says, No, 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 stop, that's not my bag. What do you mean it's not your bag? It's, uh, it's the same exact description you gave me. It's not my bag. It was, but you're seeing it, it's the same description, it's the same bag, you showed me in the picture, same bag. It's not my bag. He goes, how do you know it's not your bag? You haven't even opened it. How do you know it's not, my, it's not your bag? He goes, because my bag was full of diamonds. Diamonds are very, very light. You're carrying this bag, it's really heavy for you, so it can't be my bag. That's what God's telling us. If you follow my Torah, my Torah is full of diamonds. If it's hard for you, if these mitzvot are hard for you, it's not my Torah, you're doing something different, you're doing something wrong. It's not my, my Torah is not hard. My mitzvot are not hard. What did I tell you to? Wash your hands? What did I tell you to? Say a blessing after, after you came out of the bathroom so you thank God that your body works? It's such a big deal to eat an animal that's healthier for you because it's kosher, because... They salted it, took out the blood, so you're not a scavenger, so you're not an animal. To be nice to people, not to be angry, to, to work on your character. That, that's something's wrong with that. You should be wanting to do it anyway. That's diamonds. Yeah. It's a diamond. So if it's heavy for you, you're, do, you're doing something wrong. It's not my Torah. My Torah is diamonds. And that's why Moshe Rabbeinu spent so much time, a whole book about rebuking the nation, explaining to them, look, all these mistakes are your mistakes. It's not God's mistakes. He didn't make any, he didn't make any mistakes. And that's why, going back to the parasha, Yaakov spends his last moments blessing his children. But if you notice, when he blesses his children, it's not always compliments. When he blesses Reuven, the oldest son, he rebukes him. He tells him that you lost your first, uh, your first bornhood. If you're right, you're technically supposed to be my oldest, supposed to be the leader, you lost it. Why? Because you're not, you, you made bad decisions. You're too emotional. Too erratic. Yes, I know it was passionate. I know that you have a lot of love. I know you did tshuva. Reuven is the first one to ever do tshuva. Without being uh, asked. Meaning, you know, when uh, Cain killed Abel, he did tshuva eventually. When Adam made a sin, he did tshuva. Anyone that made a sin, he did tshuva. 
but they did, they all did tshuva before Reuven, they all did tshuva after they got punished. Reuven did tshuva before any punishment happened. Nothing happened to Reuven, and he, he realized that he made a mistake when he took his uh, mother's, uh, his father's bed and put it next to his mother's after Rachel died. He knew he made a mistake. He knew he, he realized he made a mistake, and he did tshuva. And that's why at the time that Joseph was sold, Reuven wasn't there. It says Reuven came back. Where did he go? He told the brothers not to kill him, to throw him in the hole, because it says he was planning on saving him. But then Joseph was sold, and it says Reuven came back. Where did he come back from? He went and he was praying because he was fasting, and he couldn't watch his brothers eat. As all of his brothers, while Joseph was in the hole, all of his brothers were eating. They're all eating, you know, they're having their lunch, like normal human beings, even though their brother is suffering. It's not exactly normal, but nonetheless, they're all eating. Ruven was fasting, just like we were supposed to be fasting yesterday. The tent of Tevet was supposed to fast. We talked about it yesterday's shiur. Why do we fast in Judaism? I'm not going to go over it today, it's lack of time, but you should watch it. It's why do we fast? Does Hashem really care about whether we eat or not? Why well, just likes to see us suffer, that we don't eat a whole day? So there's actually a big, big... Uh, misunderstanding about why we fast. People think that just God likes to see us torture ourselves for some strange reason. If he wants us to, to not eat, he just brings famine to the world, like he did to Egypt. So it has nothing to do with just not, not uh, torturing us. It has a lot more to do with connecting with him and having less materialism. But nonetheless, with, uh, with Ruven, Ruven was fasting, and... After he, finished, after he finished praying, he came back to the hole to go save his brother, and he realized his brother's not there, and he realized that the brother sold him. So now, but he still, so he did tshuva, but his father said, listen, you already made a big sin, of course, in Shemayim, hopefully they, they forgive you for what you did, but you still made a, you are still a very emotional person, but I promise you that there's going to come a time where your tribe is going to be blessed by Moses, the leader of Israel. And based on your actions, he's going to bless you accordingly. There was still a, also a misunderstanding bef between the tribe of Reuben and Moses, which we'll go over at the time that uh, we go over that parasha. But nonetheless, he got blessed by Moses. But at this time, with moments left in his life, Jacob decides to tell Reuben all of these difficult things. After that, he rebukes Shimon and Levi. And he says, accursed is your anger. Your, your, your behavior is unacceptable. Not them. He's not cursing them. But he's saying that their behavior, obviously, is unacceptable. And that's the worst possible thing that you can do. Accursed is their rage, for it is intense. The worst possible thing that you can do is be an angry person. When someone is angry, according to the Gemara, he's idol-worshipping. Anger. Someone expresses their anger. Not if they're angry just inside. Someone expresses their anger, takes a table, starts smashing it, beats people up. Someone starts yelling at people. It's the equivalent of idol worship, which we just talked about. Why is it equivalent to idol worship? Because someone that's angry is also, is that anger stems from pride. How does it stem from pride? Because when someone is pride, he thinks that he's entitled to everything. Everything has to go his way. So when it doesn't go his way, that means he gets angry. So why does somebody? Why would anybody think that think that everything needs to go his way? Because he thinks that he's the master of his own uh, destiny. So in essence, he's turning himself into an idol. That's why the Gemara say just say it's a very very scary thing. Someone doesn't understand these things. It's a uh, a very very. Uh, it's the worst midah of all is to be angry. And that's why it says in the beginning of the of the letter, the Rambam wrote to his son. We talked about it before is that the worst midah of all is to be angry because all types of gayanom take control over you. There's no, there's no limitation to how many sins you can make when you become angry. Now, we all know all of this stuff. But the question is, what is the solution of anger? Anger is not easy to fix. The um, Rabbi Israel from Salant, who started the, a, a Musar movement, said that in order for a person to change a character trait, it's not overnight. It's not even close to overnight. If someone learns Gemara, learns the, the Talmud, 
and he does one page per day, one daf per day. It takes approximately seven and a half years to finish the entire Gemara, the entire Shas, which is a huge undertaking. Big. If you sit, finish it, most people don't finish it even once in their life. So if you finish the entire Talmud in seven years, it's considered a big undertaking. Obviously, there's some people that finish it much faster, but again, even for a person that's smart and dedicated, you finish it once every seven years, it's a big, big undertaking. There's an uh, organization that makes a, a huge event where the whole, uh, you know, people from all over the world learn the same page independently every day. Daf Yomi, is they, they call it, Daf Yomi, a, a page each day, or Daf each day, uh, all over the world. And they all learn the same thing each day, and after seven and a half years at the sa same exact time, they have a party uh, in the Madison Square Garden. They rent out the entire Madison Square Garden in New York, or other big stadiums, with tens of thousands of people to celebrate this big, uh, big event. Um, so, so finishing the Gemara, finishing the t studying the Talmud just one time is a very, very big undertaking and a very big commitment. Rabbi Yisrael from Salan says to change one character trait takes everyday work, just like the Gemara, but it's more difficult. It takes at least it takes six years. It takes at least six years, and it's much, much more difficult than finishing the entire Gemara. Why? Because most people, number one, don't realize that they need to fix themselves. Second of all, it's very easy to lose steam. It's very easy to lose, you know, at one point just say, okay, I worked on it enough, I'm not, I'm not angry anymore. After you read a few self-help books, you read a couple of books, you went to a seminar by Tony Robbins, okay, I'm not angry anymore. Six months later, the guy, <laughs> the guy beat up his best friend. <laughs> you know, so people, you know, to really work on character traits, it really requires everyday work. All of us need to work on these things. Some people are angry, some people are, have other problems, but nonetheless, to change character traits require a lot of work. So, the solution is, number one, to realize there's no shortcut. Number two is to realize that the only way we can solve these issues is by following the instructions, following the one that put these things in this world. The Torah is the one that teaches all of these things, and there's, there's Torah teachings about how to fix each one of these character flaws that we have. Everyone has character flaws. Part of the uh, job uh, and the purpose of a person in this world is to develop their character, to become a better human being. The Torah is not just about looking a certain way and acting a certain way and, a, uh, you know, and uh, being next to certain people. The Torah is about becoming a better person that improves the world around him. The, excuse me, part of the reason why Hashem sent us to the four corners of the world aside from the fact that it was partially a, a, a punishment, is number one, to better the rest of the world, to be a light to the rest of the nations, and two, towards the end of times, to convert many people that want to be part of Judaism. And that's actually a misunderstanding, that some people think that Judaism does not want converts. It's a mistake, it's a very big mistake, it's not true at all. Judaism would love to have converts. The reason why it's a much more difficult process than Christianity or Islam, or any of the other religions out there, uh, is because we can't afford to have fake converts. So, the process is much more difficult. We want to make sure that whoever whoever's converting is serious. He's not doing it for his girlfriend. She's not doing it for her boyfriend. She's not doing it because her friend did it. And she's not doing it because they, uh, you know it's, it's, in, uh, it's in fashion now. Or she heard that this movie star is Jewish, so maybe I want to be like this movie star. You know, you're doing it because you know the truth and you want to learn the truth, you want to commit. That's why also people that go and uh, go through conversions, one of the main things they have to understand is that if they have, if they go, they go through the whole process and they go to the Bedin and they answer all the questions right, if they go into the mikveh with no intention of keeping the mitzvot, Conversion is not valid. The rabbis can tell you you're Jewish all they want. They don't know what you're thinking in your in your head. But in Shemaim they know. <laughs> in Shemaim they know. You go into the mikveh Muhammad, you come out Muhammad also. You don't come out uh, Avram. 
You don't come out, uh, you know, Moses. Yeah. You're still Muhammad. You go in there, Chris, you come out, Chris. You don't come out, uh, Jacob. So people need to understand. Some people do, no, no, I'm going to go to Mikveh. As soon as I do the Mikveh, I don't need to keep anything anymore. I'm Jewish already. And that's what happens. Some people do that. People, people convert with no intention whatsoever of being Jewish. So... The truth is what saves all of us because if we know the truth, we're able to make better decisions. And that's what you see at the end of, of the life of uh, Jacob. He told his sons the truth. One of the things that he told them is that in the beginning he told them, I want you to gather because I'm going to tell you what will befall you, meaning your descendants, at the end of days. He was going to tell them exactly when the Mashiach was going to come. And what was going to happen at the end of time, at the end of days? Uh, I spoke extensively about this in yesterday's show, so I recommend everybody to talk to, to watch it. Uh, but he was going to tell him exactly when the Mashiach was going to come, and Hashem stopped him. Hashem took away his knowledge about the exact time the Mashiach is going to come. But what he did do is he gave him some information about the what will happen, what will take place, the uh, war of Gogu Magog, the, uh, and, and other things that we have uh, knowledge of come one of the sources of that knowledge is from this particular uh, uh, meeting between Jacob and his sons um, but as far as the exact time of when the Mashiach is going to come the reason why God did not want to uh, tell this to Jacob is because if we knew exactly when the Mashiach is going to come then some people will think that they're able to outsmart God oh Mashiach is going to come next week okay so I'll do Chuba this week Mashiach's going to come in 20 years from now? Okay, so I'll do Chuba in 19 years from now. I go, I that's, the, that's the mentality of people. Yes. The ace is white, right? It is. You know, so in, 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 their, in, in their mind, they say, oh, better late than ever. <laughs> yes. Justifying it. Better late than ever. Yeah. So, Yaakov is rebuking his, uh, his, his first two kids. He's telling them, listen, your, your anger is something that you have to take control over. Uh, and he's giving them Musa. He's given them Musa, he's given it them on their head. Some people love Musa, some people can't take it. Some people want to hear the truth, some people can't handle it. The message gets to both of those people's heart. It's that some people don't want to don't want to change. It's too difficult for them. While other people say, okay, it's not convenient to hear that uh, I'm a sinner. It's not convenient to hear that I'm making mistakes, but at least I know, so I can change. Even if I'm not ready to do all of this, I'll do something. And that's why before uh, the month of Elul, uh, well, before the, the holiday started, I had everyone uh, that came to the shiur write one thing. It was a very, very strong lecture, a very big, strong musar. I told, I told everyone, listen, I think it was actually shiur number 45. Uh, I told everyone that, I, uh, listen, if this shiur, if this lecture doesn't affect you, I can't help you. I can't help you because this is as strong as I know. And if, if this doesn't touch your heart, nothing will. Then you're, you're stone. So, which means that at some, this has to change something for you. So I need you to write anything, anything you're willing to change. If you're going to start wearing tzitzit, if you're going to start washing your hands, if you're going to start keeping Shabbat, whatever, each person with their own issues. But some level of commitment... And I wish I could do it in every lecture because realistically, that's what that's the ideal. You want everyone to commit to something. No one is going to get from here to the, their ultimate level overnight. It just doesn't happen. But each person, the purpose of, of going to lectures is for your heart to be touched, for you to be moved. If you go to a shiur Torah and you're not moved and you're not willing or even interested to change something about your life, not only did you waste your time, but the lecturer shouldn't have even come. If a lecturer goes to, if someone is giving shiur Torah, goes and gives people shiur Torah, and a shiur Torah doesn't affect anyone. What he's teaching is not exactly a... Uh, doesn't require anyone to change. He shouldn't even teach. He should keep the information to himself, write a book maybe. I'm serious. If you're not going to change, if you're not going to impact people, and have them improve themselves, what's the point? Exactly. Judaism is a religion of doing. It's not a religion of theory. 
It's not a, it's not a religion of, oh, me, I, I intended to do a mitzvah, but instead I went to the club. I just didn't get the chance. You know, Judaism is it's a, it's a religion of doing mitzvah. It's doing stuff. You know, we have to we have to realize that. So, if you come to a lecture and the person that's telling you things, you don't connect, you don't understand, you don't re- fine. But one times, two times, three times, you realize that this person is maybe interesting to some people, maybe even interesting to you, but it doesn't obligate you. It doesn't obligate you in any way. There's no purpose of going to the shul. This is also part of the reason why Christianity is so popular. Most people don't understand about Christianity and why there are churches all over the world, mostly in the United States, that literally have members of 50, 60,000 people, 200,000 people. Go to one church. It's bigger than a sports stadium. It's amazing how many people go to these places, how much money they donate. Uh, one guy I heard is evangelical Christians are mamash. It's, it's something amazing how much money they, they, they donate. Mm-hmm. One guy one asked the congregation to donate sixty five million dollars so you can buy a jet, mm-hmm. a private jet. <laughs> yeah, he probably want, he wants a private jet so he could give <laughs> lectures in other places around the world. So he wants to buy this uh, this uh, special private jet. G six hundred or something like that, and he's asking this congregation to pay for it to give him sixty five million dollars to give him a jet, and he's not the only one. This is multiple. Well, you're talking about uh, the Puerto Rican guy. I know. Yeah, he, he said he's guy, and he preached the people that he's. Get in person. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's not. It's more than one. That's the thing. More than one of them are asking for jets. This, this has become a very common thing. They're asking for private planes. They're asking for uh, you know all these. You know they live the life of the rich and famous. These uh, priests and uh, either way, why do people go to these places? I mean, if you spend any time reading the New Testament, which I don't recommend for anybody, but if you spend any time in the New Testament, you see that there's contradictions and mistakes in every single page. It's not exactly a, uh, you know, it doesn't require that much effort to see these contradictions. One, one simple example is you see that in the beginning they say that uh, J.C. was born from, a, from God. You know, Mary had a relationship with, with God himself, and somehow J.C. came out of it. Okay, fine, let's, you know, the fact that it's complete nonsense against the Torah is irrelevant. Let's say that happened. But then several pages later, it talks about how the genealogy of Joseph. And it gives you 25 different names. And then another book gives you 25 different names from the first 25. There's two different 25s. And they claim that both of them are the genealogy of, of Joseph, which the two 25, list of 25 are supposed to agree with each other, at the minimum. They disagree with each other. But nonetheless, why do I care what the genealogy of Joseph is if he's not really the father of J.C.? What they're trying to do is to connect Joseph, the carpenter, to King David. Because they know that in our Torah it says that in order for someone to be the Messiah, it has to come from King David. Okay. So they're trying to connect Joseph the carpenter with King David. Okay, fine. Even if he's connected to King David, which he's not. Even in their own book there's mistakes. But nonetheless, even if he is connected to, the, to, to King David... He's not J.C.'s father. You just said on the first page that God's his father. What, God is the son of King David? So this contradiction is that if you just spend five minutes on this stuff, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. That's why I send it. when I send discs to people, I also send them the debate that Rabbi Mizrahi had and other debates that are out there between Christianity and Judaism because it's good for Jews to know the mistakes of other religions because it shows you the quality of information that we have. The, I think it actually may be on that uh, disc number one. Yeah. So, the key is to understand that all of these other religions have one major thing in common. Christianity and Catholicism has one major thing in common with each other, which is it doesn't obligate people. It doesn't obligate you to do anything. You don't have to keep any meat about. You don't have to do anything. Okay, one, once a year you have to put some ashes on your head maybe, not eat meat, 
Uh, and uh, but even if you don't do it, it's not a big deal, as long as you believe in the guy. And uh, even if you murder people, technically, if you believe in the guy, it's fine. You can do whatever you want, as long as you believe in some person that may or may not have lived 2,000 years ago. Everything's fine. So not only does it not obligate you to do anything, it actually removes any obligation that you already had on yourself. Because if somebody wanted to be a good person, and I said, listen, I'm not going to steal. I'm not going to beat up people. I'm not going to do all the bad things that I saw bad people do. But then, they go to church, and the guy say, oh yeah, I'll, I'll donate the $300 towards the $65 million jet. But that means that I, sh I have room now, since I did something more than what I needed to do, I have room. So if I make a mistake, it's not a big deal, because I believe in JC. So it removes your own obligation of yourself. And it puts you in a situation where not only do you don't have to do any mitzvot, but also gives you some false sense of justification for bad behavior. And that is because you're thinking that, okay, I could act bad, but as long as I believe in this belief, everything's okay. And that's one of the things that attracts people to it, because it gives people a false sense of hope. So while they do bad things, while they steal, while they're not saying that all Christians are thieves or anything, I'm just saying that while a person that's wicked is stealing or killing or doing anything that's against the Torah, he still feels unreligious because I donate some money. And this also goes back to us Jews. Many Jews that are not keeping mitzvot are saying, no, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, religious in my heart. I'm not keeping anything, <laughs> but I'm religious in my heart. In my heart, God knows what I believe. This is complete nonsense. There's no such thing religious in your heart. So you're religious in your heart, but you're, by Torah's definition, you're an enemy of Hashem. How could, how could the two be? Doesn't yeah. make any sense. Yeah. Just, that, just that we were watching a video where um, it was a debate and pastor with the rabbi. And the rabbi said to the pastor, okay, let's say I'm the, 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 the Messiah. Mm -hmm. Say, yeah, yeah, okay. You agree that I'm the Messiah? Yeah, okay. When I come back, I'll tell you that. Oh, yeah, yeah, I saw it, I saw it, yeah. Yeah, I saw it. And that's, uh, yeah, old man, old man, it's in Jerusalem, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah he's, he's funny, he's clever, he's clever. But that's, that's the thing, it's, it's with, the reason why it's like, that. the reason why people are attracted to it is because it gives them a false sense of being righteous. They believe that they're righteous because they're part of this big organization. Two, it makes them part of this very, very big religion. People always want to be part of something really big and something that's the favorite. There's two billion of them in the world, so of course they're right. Mm -hmm. you know, the logic says that. Second thing is that the third thing is is that also it's a it makes you feel like you're you're good. You're doing the right thing. Yeah. <clears throat> and it doesn't make you it doesn't uh, put you in a situation where you have to change anything about yourself. You could do as you please. As long as you uh, do a few things, whether you have uh, confession or, or, or other things out there, everything is fine. Judaism and the Torah is nothing like that. Aside from the fact that you have to follow the mitzvot, you have to work on your character, you have to treat people a certain way, you have to be a good, you know, you have to be a good person, you have to be a light to the nation. So when Jews are telling people, listen, we're going to test you, and test you and test you over and over again if you really want to convert to Judaism and you want to go to an orthodox legitimate conversion you're going to have to be tested it's not just a test whether you know information you can memorize stuff but we want to test to see if you're truly going to you know if you really want to do this one of the main things that you, you're asked during conversion is why why would you want to be Jewish we're the most persecuted nation in history you're, jo you're not joining the favorite in this world. You're joining the underdog. We're the ones that get beat up all the time. Of course, we've won overall. I mean, all the, all the nations that have, that have uh, beat us up throughout the years, whether it was the Nazis, the Turks, the Spaniards, the uh, uh, Greeks, the Romans, wherever it was, they're not here, we are. But still, we get beat up every day. Why would you want to join that? I actually remember... 
hearing a, a rabbi say, you're out of your mind, there's something wrong with you, why would you want to be a Jew? Obviously, he's not trying to a, uh, discourage the person, but he wants to test them. Yeah. Have you really thought about this? Like an argument. Have you <laughs> truly thought about this? So, this is to test the person to see if they really want to do it. And also, a righteous rabbi that's converting your a good uh, conversion is only going to convert you if he knows, based on his knowledge of you, that you do plan on keeping the mitzvot. If a rabbi knows that you're going to violate the mitzvot, like the core ones, I'm not talking about, obviously everyone makes some type of uh, sin, even the most righteous people make some type of sin. But if he knows that you're not planning on keeping Shabbat, if he knows that you're not planning on keeping kosher, if he knows that you're not planning on keeping the foundation of Judaism, he's not only is he not allowed to convert you, even if he converts you, it doesn't count. Like we said before, Muhammad stays Muhammad. Okay, maybe the, the rabbi is fooled by money, or he's fooled by you know your 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 uh, your charm, but in Shemaim, they're not fooled not by money not by money or not by not by charm. So that's the thing that people need to understand. Conversion is something that's a, it's a life commitment, it's an eternal commitment. The reward is endless. The reward is endless, and in, in Judaism, a convert is considered higher than a natural born Jew. Someone is naturally born as a Jew. Righteous parents, does mitzvot his whole life, versus someone that's a convert, that's a righteous convert, convert's considered higher. According to why, the, uh, loving the convert and the special protection of a convert, a righteous convert, is mentioned in the Torah more times than anything else, more than Shabbat. It's mentioned 48 times. Jews are obligated to love each other, but a convert has one extra. He's, you're obligated to love him as a Jew, and you're also obligated to love him as a convert. It's two separate things. You're supposed to, you have to love a convert even more than you do a natural-born Jew. So the reward for a convert is eternal. It's in this world, it's in the next world, it's something extraordinary. It's the best thing you could possibly do for yourself. If you're able to commit. If you're not able to commit, you don't need to convert. Be a Noahide, keep the seven laws of Noah, and you're fine. You know, there's nothing wrong with it. It's not for everyone. But again, it's, it's, it's all based on whether someone wants to be righteous with Hashem, whether someone wants to be you know, honest with himself and uh, not just uh, try to uh, fit in in any way. You know, and really, truly, truly do what, what Hashem requests us of. It's not easy. You know, as a, a friend of mine says, Lo pashut liot yudi pashut. It's not easy. It's not simple to be a simple Jew. You know, and that's that's that, and it's honestly, this is, this is a uh, it's it's a very true statement. It's not simple to be a simple Jew. Uh, it's 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 you know it takes it takes effort, but when you realize that you're carrying diamonds, all of a sudden the bag becomes lighter. If you don't know what's in the bag, you're upset that you're even carrying the bag. But if you realize if you peeked into the bag for a second. So, it's full of five carat diamonds. All of a sudden, you're lifting the bag one hand, you're running around, you're enjoying it. Oh, give me another bag. You know, it's diamonds. So, in reality, whether we keep the mitzvot or not and enjoy it or not, it's all based on perception. The only way to get the right perception is by learning what it says. This is where Musar comes in. When we do, when we learn Musar, when we learn about character development, how to improve our traits, how to improve ourselves, how to, how to improve ourselves as human beings, based on the definition of good that God has, not mankind. Because as we've talked about already tonight, mankind's definition of good today is a little bit of a problem with it. Yeah. To say the least. So... We have to look at what is God's definition of good. Okay, let's try to be good. When we do this stuff, by learning Musa, by learning how to do these things, all of a sudden you start noticing that not only are you changing as a person, and all of a sudden you're not angry, and all of a sudden being a little more generous, and all of a sudden you're not as anxious, you're not as stressed out, and you discover there's a secret to life. 
something that everyone here and everyone around the world, all everyone is aiming for, but very, very few ever reach. And that's happiness. Everyone in the world wakes up every single day and says, I want to be happy. No one in the world wakes up in the, in, in the morning and says, oh, I want to be miserable today. I want to be extra miserable. No one, wants, no one wants to be miserable. Everyone wants to be happy. The key to happiness is to understand that it's not something that you could just buy. It's not something you just wake up with. It's not, a, uh, it's not something that uh, you get infected by, uh, you know, if you hang out with happy people, you'll be happy. That's just, you know, maybe they're happy they have a wonderful life. doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't change your life. Maybe you have problems. <laughs> <laughs> Happiness is not, it's not something material. And that's what people, most people misunderstand. They think that if they get more stuff, that stuff is somehow going to close the hole that's in their heart. Right. Happiness is something spiritual. Yes. So you cannot get a spiritual feeling by material. By material. Yes. I've, 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 I've known people getting angry at happy people. They're angry because all of course. people are happy. Of course. Well, I remember myself. What are they so happy about? What's so, what's so great about this world that you're so happy about? That's what I would ask myself. I remember. When people walking around with this smile and you get upset about it because you're not happy. Like, what are you so happy about? I'm stressed out. I have so many problems. I have this, I have that, and they're happy. What's, you think there's something wrong with them? No, but in, in reality, it's, number one, jealousy. Number two, it reminds you of how miserable you are. People don't, understand, don't really truly see their own situation until they see the outside world. That's why I always tell people that, you know, a poor person doesn't know that he's poor until he sees a rich person. If there's a poor person on an island, and he's, you know, he's by himself with, let's say there's another 25 people, and somehow he got, you know, a 35-year-old uh, car. He's the only one on the island that has a car. When there was a shipwreck, his car survived. He's 35 years old, and he's the only one that has a car. And he's, but in, back at home, before the shipwreck, he was considered poor. But now on this island, he's considered rich. He's happy, he's great, everything is wonderful, right? When does he become miserable again? As soon as somebody else shows up with a better car. <laughs> he, he loves his car, he thinks his car is the best car in the world. But as soon as somebody else comes to the island with a brand new car, he can't stop hating his own car. He can't stop thinking about how poor he is. So it's all based on our perception. So, when we're learning all of these things... It's very, very important for us to understand that the definition of good, we have to look at what God says, not what mankind says. The grass on the other, on the other side is irrelevant. It doesn't matter what they have. It doesn't matter what people have. It has nothing to do with it. It's what Hashem decides for them to have, to have. It has nothing to do with you. If anything, if you hear that somebody is doing well, you should be happy for them. Because you cannot get towards happiness with a mindset that there's a limitation in the world. A lot of people have a problem, with, you know, they always eat, they talk about other people's money all the time. It's become very fashionable today to talk about athletes and, and, a, uh, and um, other types of superstar and how much money they make. You go, oh, this guy, this, uh, I don't know, baseball player makes $100 million and this model makes $200 million and now I made this and now I made $20 million and now I made $100 million. People love to talk about that stuff. They love talking about how much other people make. First thing I've always thought, and I never understood why anyone wants to talk about it, what do you care? He's not paying your bills. What do you care if he makes $200 million? If he was paying your bills, then yeah, of course, hopefully he makes more money so you can pay more of your bills. <laughs> <laughs> he's, not paying nice, your, huh? he's not paying your bills. Yeah. He doesn't care how much money you have. He's not talking about you. You know, so I, I don't know why people do. But the second thing is, is that it's only remind when you talk about other people's money, it's only reminding you of how little you have. Why would you do that to yourself? It's self-defeating. If you're talking about other people having $200 million, you don't have $200 million. You're just reminding yourself of how much less you have. Yeah, so what, what's, what's, the, what's the point? <coughs> but if you have the nature where you're happy when other people are happy and you're happy that other people are successful, great. Most, you know, it's very tough for people to get to that point. 
Um, so again, these types of uh, little uh, secrets are all over the Torah. They're all over this, you know, teaching of the Gemara and the, from Musar books and the Torah. All of these things are part of what Musar is. And that's the message that Jacob and all of the sages told each one of their sons or their people before they died. And the reason why they chose that time to give that message is because they knew that that's the one message they're going to remember. If we talk to, if you talk to somebody today and every day and every week and every month, okay, once in a while you're going to forget what the conversation was because you're used to talking to them every day and every month and every year. But if you know they're on their deathbed, you're going to remember that speech. You're going to remember what they told you. Yes. It's the last thing that you ever that you ever heard from them. That's why when people talk about September 11th or other major events that have happened throughout history, people always remember where they were. Where were you on September 11th? Most people remember where they were where on September 11th. Even if they didn't live in New York or anywhere near New York. Mm -hmm. They remember that on September 11th they were at a certain street or a certain bar or a certain you know, office or doing something certain. Where were you when JFK got assassinated? Oh, the people that lived during that time. I was doing this, I was eating this, I was drinking a Coke. How do you remember this stuff? Because it's a memorable event. Jacob knows this. He goes, this is a memorable event. They're going to remember with my, my last day in life. So I need to make this day useful. I'm not going to play chess with them. I'm not going to tell them how great they are and how wonderful they are and how much I love them and give them kisses and I miss you and all this stuff. That's not, that's not going to help their life. What's going to help their life is me telling them the truth. Especially knowing that they're going to remember this message. The truth is above mm -hmm. everything. And when you know that the person you're talking to is going to remember it, you have to take advantage of the opportunity. One of the things that I try to do each time in each lecture is mention some, at least part of the foundation of each of the mitzvot, especially Shabbat, you meant Probably every one of my shiras mentioned Shabbat at one point or another. Personally, I think it's the biggest problem we have. And second of all, I think it's the most understated mitzvah that we have because pe most people don't realize how significant it is. Just statistics show 80% of Ami does not keep Shabbat. That's a problem. So, the reason why I mention it is because each lecture I have new people, even though sometimes the same people come. But you have new people here and there. It's one person that's brand new that I never met before. So I don't know if I'm ever going to see them again. I don't know if they're going to go on YouTube and might watch my shiur. I don't know if I'm ever going to have a chance to ever speak to this person again. So I can't risk not saying it. Why? Let's say I leave this world tomorrow. I go up to Shemaim. I'm finished. You're never going to hear me again. Okay, they wait some time after 120. They leave the world. Hashem asks them, oh, uh, Mr. Uh, Stephen, did you keep Shabbat? No. But how did you not keep Shabbat? You went to Shul Torah. Yeah, a long time ago I had a Shul Torah. This guy, uh, Yaron Ruben, he gave a Shul Torah. Okay, Yaron Ruben talks about Shabbat. <laughs> no, no, you didn't talk to me about Shabbat. I don't remember. Oh. So they're going to review the Shul. Oh, you didn't talk about Shabbat. I'm, par I'm partially responsible for you not keeping Shabbat. It's too much of a risk. It's not worth it. Now, again, there's so much someone can do. By the same token, when you know that someone is there and is obviously making a sin that's too significant, you have some level of obligation to tell them. It's an obligation, it's a biblical obligation, it's in the Torah itself. You're obligated to rebuke your people. Now, obviously, you can't openly embarrass them. You can't just call them out in the street. Hey, Steve, you're Mechal Shabbat. Rasha. <laughs> <laughs> no, poor Steve. You can't do that. The guy's going to start crying in the middle of Shabbat. He's scared. Okay, you're take right. him to the side. Talk to him. Listen, by the way, Steve, I don't know if you know, but the fourth commandment is Shabbat. Not allowed to do it. If I don't know. Maybe I don't know enough about it. So here's a disc. Talks about Shabbat. Maybe you should watch it. I'll watch it with you. If it's a if it's a kid, if it's a you know young kid, if it's one of your, you know somebody's child, fifteen years old, telling them Shabbat no Shabbat if they're not going to yeshiva is tough. So what do you do? Okay, listen. If you watch this DVD or you listen to this shiur Torah about Shabbat, I'll give you fifty bucks. Money always works with kids. Oh, I'll buy you a game. I'll take you to whatever or something. 
Give them, if you have to pay them, pay them. If you have to buy them something, buy them something. Why? Because you're saving their soul. And that's it. If you can't deliver the message yourself, get somebody else to do it. But it's very, very important to be, to do what ja Yaakov is doing here. Why? Because number one, you don't know if you, if, if this person knows the truth or not. Most likely he doesn't because you have to be insane to violate it knowing. Because again, I'm not telling you guys all the consequences of violating Shabbat because it's, it's heavy and yeah. it's dear. And it's scary. But you get the message. You know, you get the message. Because what I'm telling you is not even 1%. <laughs> no. You know, so again, it's significant. So it's not worth it. And also, the best part about it is that if you actually keep Shabbat like you're supposed to, it's enjoyable. Turn the whole world off. No phone, no computer, no car, no nothing. Just turn, just be with your family, be with your friends. What's so bad about it? You hate them that much, you don't want to be with them for a full day? <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with your family and friends? Nothing. Be with them. Pay attention to the world. Stop looking at your phone. Stop, uh, you know. What's the big deal? So this Shabbat becomes a very, very enjoyable day. So, again, if we can deliver the message, we do it. If we can't, we find another way. Give them a disc. Give them a, uh, a link on the computer. Uh, you know, a YouTube video. Things like this. Have sure me a house. All these different things. It's the best thing you can do. Because why? Because once a person wakes up, like, you know what? This is the best thing that ever happened to me. I actually have one day a week where I take vacation. The whole year I work and, you know, and, and work overtime and overtime and overtime, more overtime, so hopefully my boss gives me a one-week paid vacation. What do I worry about this vacation? I have vacation every week. One day a week of complete vacation. You have 52 days a year vacation. Minimum, because that doesn't count the holidays. Right. It's pure vacation. You don't need your boss to give you permission. The boss from Shemaim obligates you. He obligates you to take vacation. So again, when you have these opportunities to, to, to tell people the truth, you have to take advantage of them. This is one of the most foundational Very lessons nice. we learned from the, from, 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 the, from, the, uh, from the sages. It's what we learned from our patriarchs. We learn this from them because this is the basis to life. If there's no truth, there's nothing. The stamp of Hashem is emet. Emet means truth. When he wrote the Torah, 974 generations before he created the world, he wrote it giving not only mankind rules, he gave himself rules. Why did he give himself rules? He says, I love, it's my creation, so of course I'm going to love my creation more than they even love themselves. So Moses comes to me and he says, listen, I kept your entire Torah. I made a couple of sins in my entire life. Aside from that, everything you wanted I did, and even sins that I made are not even intentional. Okay, Moses gets Gan Eden. Great. Then you have little Shalom. Comes over and he says, no, God, I didn't keep any of your mitzvot, but I was a very funny comedian. Made a lot of people laugh. Once in a while, I gave the homeless guy that was outside of the comedy st uh, studio a few dollars. I bought him a shawarma. No, God, I was your creation. Don't you love me? God says, yes, I do love you, but I gave myself rules. If I didn't give myself rules, and I didn't give myself the stamp of being emet, being truth, then actually I would let you go, because I love you. But I can't. Why? Because if I let you go... My entire Torah becomes one lie. And Moses, that worked his whole life to get the Gan Eden, is going to be in the same place as you? That can't make sense. Can't make sense. It makes me a liar. Hashem can't be a liar. And that's what people that say, well, I'm religious in my heart. and say, no, once I get up there, we'll work it out. It's, it's, it can't. You know, there's, it's no, it's no, it doesn't work that way. It's no farther from the truth. You're, you're, tr you're humanizing God. Yeah. Because you know, when you're thinking of a person, you're saying, listen, I know he's a tough guy. I know he's a little conceited. I know he's this, I know he's this, I know he's that, but I know how to talk to him. You know, somebody always says this. Let's say there's a person in a position of power, or whether it's the president of a country or a company or even a principal of a school. Kids always think that they somehow have a special relationship with the pre principal of the school. Yeah, I know he's this, he's this, he's this, he's this, but I got a special connection with him. So I'm going to cut class, but tomorrow I'll explain to him what and who and then. 
Okay, well, a person, maybe you can get away with it once or twice. God, you can't get away with it. He's not a person. He doesn't think like a person. And that's the thing. That's, that's, that's the misunderstanding that people have about Torah, where they think that it's, you can compare the Torah to people. And that's, in essence, what the other religions did. They humanized God. When you said God came back to the world as, uh, as human flesh, you humanized God. So, of course, you're going to think about God like a human. Of course, you're going to say, no, he took my sins for me. He loves me so much, he took all my sins. But you didn't make the sins yet. Yeah, even the ones that I didn't make. He took them already. So, that's, that's what happens when you humanize God. It completely removes all obligation from a person to act like a person. And that's why you have the situations happening around the world where people act literally like animals. So, the, uh, we'll finish in a few minutes. The key here that we see is that after he rebukes the first few brothers, he tells Judah that the Mashiach is going to come from him. How does he, he doesn't tell him literally, he doesn't use the, uh, the word Mashiach, but he uses the word Shiloh. Shiloh is another name for the Mashiach. Says a lion cub is Judah. Each one of the brothers had a symbol, had a sign. Joseph was a bull. Uh, a, uh, Judah was a lion, and the other brothers also had uh, different signs. So each one, each tribe had a flag with their signs. Mm -hmm. And also their powers, if you guys remember in the last year, I told you that some of them have literally uh, special powers. Mm -hmm. That's the foundation of comic books and all the special powers, superheroes, comes from the Torah. You know, the uh, Judah was ultra strong. He had a, uh, a uh, roar of a lion, even stronger than a lion, where he would roar, he would literally be able to destroy cities with his roar, just with his voice. He was ultra strong physically. Um, so this is all in the Midrash, a lot of cool stuff. And the other show, you watch uh, uh, the, the YouTube videos, talks about some of this stuff. Really, really cool stories. Uh, better than any comic book. And, uh, <laughs> and anyway, so uh, he says, uh, A lion cub is Judah. Uh, From the prey, my son, you elevated yourself. So by this, he's saying, what do you mean by from the prey, my son, you elevated yourself? Technically, Judah had an opportunity to either lose everything or gain everything in one instance. And that's the story of Judah and Tamal. When Judah cohabited with Tamal, he didn't know that Tamal was Tamal. He thought she was a prostitute. Mm -hmm. And Hashem, in essence, pushed him on Tamal because he wouldn't have done it otherwise. Because Hashem wanted to bring the Mashiach in an unnatural way. And the reason why he wanted to bring him in an unnatural way is because since the Mashiach, when the Mashiach comes, one of the first things he's going to do is, or ultimate things he's going to do, is take away evil from the world. Evil is the evil inclination, the Satan. The one that's enjoying all of us making sins, he's going to remove them to, from the world. So the one thing that the Satan doesn't want, want to happen is the Mashiach to come. So he's always going to try to get in the way. So even if you pay attention to the story of the source of the Mashiach throughout all the Torah, each story that involves him is always strange. Whether it's the daughters of uh, Lot, where they had incest with their father, they're actually, you know, after uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, Hashem destroyed the world, Hashem destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, they thought that Hashem destroyed the world, they went into a hiding into a cave, where the angel helped them get to that cave, protected them, and they hid in the cave. Two young daughters and the father. The mother died on the way because she didn't follow what Hashem said. You know, said, don't look back. She looks back. She turned into a pillar of salt. They went into a cave. There was wine in the cave. And, you know, they, uh, they, they thought, okay, listen, the world is destroyed. We have to restart mankind. They were trying to do a mitzvah weren't uh, into their father or some sick thought that people have today. They were trying to restart mankind. They knew that Adam and Eve 
at that time that we were allowed to be with with a uh, with your family. So that's why Cain and Abel were each born with a twin. Cain was was born with a twin sister. Abel was born with two twin sisters. So that's who were their wives. That's actually part of the reason why Cain was jealous of Abel. Because he had two wives and, and Cain only had one wife. That's the reason why he killed him. It wasn't just about the story of the sacrifice and how Hashem didn't accept the sacrifice. There's a story behind the story. So anyway, they, were, they figured, okay, God allowed us, allowed Adam and Eve to start the world by doing incest, so we have to restart the world. They thought that the world was destroyed, so they cohabited it with the father, and from their seed is actually where part of where the Mashiach comes. One side of the Mashiach comes. On the other hand, then we have Judah and Tamar. Judah, his wife, died. Tamar was married to both uh, two out of the three sons that Judah had. Both of them died because they were wicked. Hashem didn't want them to waste seed. They were wasting seed. And Hashem killed them. And, uh, but Tamar had got a prophecy that the Mashiach is going to come from Judah. She wanted to be part of it. She wanted to be the mother of, uh, you know, the descendant of the Mashiach. So she pretended to be a prostitute. And Hashem, in essence, pushed Judah to do this. Again, an unnatural thing. If we fast forward even more, King David, King David and Bathsheba. You know, a lot of people question that whole thing. Many people in the world think that King David sinned. With Bathsheba, he really didn't sin, according to the Gemara. Anyone that says that King David sinned is making a mistake. He didn't sin. She was, uh, she was not with her husband at the time. She was divorced. She had already a get. But needless to say, again, the whole story is strange. Why? When King David had other wives, he had any woman that he wanted in the world. He was the king. It had to go for Bathsheba. It had to be Tamar dressing like a prostitute. It had to be Lot with his own daughters. And other stories involving, or Ruth, the Moabite, she was a convert. Mm -hmm. It had to be through a convert. You couldn't bring it to a nice little Jewish girl. Why, 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 why not to go to a convert? So the beauty of it is, number one, Hashem is showing you how the righteous come from everywhere. Jews, non-Jews, they come from everywhere. Converts can get to a much higher level than, uh, you know, regular Jews. Because again, unlike a natural born Jew, the convert chose Hashem. Natural born Jew was born into it. Someone that is not obligated, not, 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 you know, non-Jew is not obligated to follow all the 613 mitzvot. He's obligated to follow the seven laws of Noah and anything that's common sense. So when that non-Jew decides to convert and says, no, Hashem, I want to do everything that you say, and not just what you obligated me, but even more. I want to take more on myself. Most Jews don't even want what we have. He wants to take even more. So he chose Hashem. The Jews didn't choose anything. He was born that way. That's why Hashem loves him so much that he's a convert. So Hashem adds that to the story. He adds all of these un, you know, things that are unusual to the story of the Mashiach. One is to trick the evil inclination, trick the, the Satan. But two is to show you how his wisdom is nothing like ours. It has human minds think that we know so much more than we really do. We know nothing. And his wisdom works in a completely different way. And he says it in the Torah, I don't think like you. In any way, you cannot compare man to God. And you see this just with the root of the Mashiach. So he says here to uh, uh, to Judah, as he blesses him, he says that uh, you had an opportunity to either be a uh, prey, but you elevated yourself. How did he elevate himself? When, when uh, you cohabited with, uh, with uh, Tamar, you didn't know, and then, you know, you were going to burn her because, you know, you thought that she was making, uh, you know, doing something that was not allowed. No. But then she rebuked you and she told you, listen, uh, she didn't even tell you to your face. She just said, you know who this belongs to. So she gave you the opportunity to either admit to what you did or deny it. Right. So in essence, you were prey, 
because you had an opportunity where at that point you could, a uh, you know, maybe win by not being embarrassed in front of everyone, mm -hmm. but you lose everything else as far as mm -hmm. what's what uh, what your seed could be potentially, but you elevate yourself by lowering yourself by telling the truth. And then he says he crouches, lies down like a lion, and like an awesome lion who dares rouse him. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a scholar from among his descendants, until Shiloh shall arrive, and his will, and his will be an assemblage of nations. So that right says, you know, from you is going to come Shiloh. Shiloh is one of the names of the Mashiach. But why did it happen? All of this was because Judah was willing to lower himself for the sake of truth. Judah was the leader. He wasn't like a regular person. He could have easily denied the whole story of Tamar, could have got another girlfriend, another wife, could have done whatever he wanted. He lowered himself. Why? Because he realized there's something much higher than him. There's something above. He watches. There's an eye that sees everything. There's an ear that hears everything. He knows there's a real boss to the world. Let me stay quiet. Let me tell people the truth. And that's one of the main messages that you hear from every one of these stories that the people that are mentioned in the Torah, they're not mentioned in the Torah because they were really smart. They're not mentioned in the Torah because they were really beautiful. Okay, some of them were really beautiful. Like Joseph was a beautiful person. King Solomon was a very smart person. Judah was very, very strong. Moses was extremely strong. Right, but that's not the reason why God mentions them in the Torah. They all had a common quality. They were all humble. They're all ultra humble. Humility is a very, very important characteristic to have if somebody wants to have a connection with Hashem. The only way to get it is by learning the, the, the words of Hashem. And this is why the very next blessing that we'll finalize the year with this, unless you guys have questions, which I'm more than happy to answer, I just don't want you guys to, uh, you know, overdo it, and uh, then tomorrow you tell me, next week you're going to tell me, listen, your year is too long. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the next blessing is that he blesses Zevulun and Issachal, the two brothers, not the two of the sons, but he blesses Zevulun before he blesses Issachal. Now, if you look at the order of the blessings, it's generally by age. So, if anything, he's supposed to bless Issachar before Zebulun. So, why is there a change in order? If you say it's because of Torah, Issachar is the Tamid Chacham. Issachar is the one that learns Torah 24 hours a day. Zebulun is the one that works every day. He's a big import-export business. So, it's not, it's not the Torah. It's not... What is it? It's because of the special arrangement that Zebulun and Issachar had. The arrangement was, Zebulun said, I'm import-export business, I'm going to give you money where well, you're not going to have any need whatsoever. I'll take care of everything you have. You, in return, you study Torah for both of us. I'll take care of all finances, you will not have any need whatsoever. It's not like, it's like oh, I'm giving the guy $100 here and there. I'm taking care of everything, you take care of everything in regards to Torah. So the business was that Issachar actually literally studied 24 hours a day. He never slept. Because he wanted the reward of all the Torah. So he said, if I'm already sharing it, I want to get more. I, wanna, I, wanna, I still want to get 100% of what I was going to get, so I just won't sleep. And the Torah gave him power to literally never sleep. But why did he do this? Why? Because he realized the significance of the Torah. Both of them realized the significance of the Torah. Issachar realized that sleep, I don't need to. If I, if I learn enough Torah, I won't need to. That's where you see some of the sages, some of the, you know, the, the big Tabidim Chachamim, the big giants of Torah in history, they didn't sleep like us, eight, ten hours a day. They sleep two hours. <laughs> sleep two hours. They don't sleep, uh, you know, they don't sleep half the day. <laughs> You know? So, you know guys, don't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it takes time. Okay, you have to train your body to yeah, get exactly. <laughs> But Zevulun realized also the value of Torah, but he also realized, you know, in order for, for Torah to exist, we have to finance it. 
it's, you need to live, you need to eat. You can't just uh, live on, uh, on, uh, on uh, nothing. So I need to make sure that this Talmud Chacham studies. I need to make sure that, you know, I help him out so he can study, get to the highest level. I'll, he still studied himself also, whenever he had time, but the biggest part of the studying was made by Yisachar, and they had the arrangement. And again, when Yaakov decides to bless them, he blesses the businessman before he blesses the Torah student. And the reason why is because in the Torah it says, the one that helps another person do a mitzvah is bigger beneficiary than the one that did the mitzvah. Mm. He's a bigger beneficiary than the one that did the mitzvah. So the fact that Zevulun is helping Issachar learn Torah, he's getting even a bigger reward for it. Because he's a true partner. It's not just staka here and there. It's, it's mamash. It's something significant. It's a full life commitment on both of their ends. And it's, that's one of the things that we need to truly understand when you're giving staka to people or organizations or, uh, or any type of cause. You have to, just like you look at your investments in stocks, in forex, in a uh, real estate, in business, you have to look at your investments of uh, how it's going to pan out. What is my reward for this? Now, there's all types of staka. You could donate for Hanukkah parties, and you can donate for saving souls. You have to look at everything as what is the reward. Zevulun is telling you that learning Torah is the number one thing in the world. At that time, and for most of the time until the last few generations, that was the number one mitzvah that you could possibly do with staka. Why? Because someone that learns Torah, every letter that he reads, letter, not every word or sentence, every letter is a mitzvah. The Chafetz Chaim did the math. He said an average Talmud Chacham can read 600,000 letters per day. If he learns, uh, if he reads an average uh, uh, what a normal person reads in, a, in an hour, he studies for 10 hours a day, he'll have 600,000 letters per day. That means he made 600,000 mitzvot per day just from his Torah learning. That's it. Just from his Torah learning. So on another hand, you say, listen, but I donated to a homeless person. Okay, so you got one mitzvah. Oh, I did tefillin. Okay, you got another mitzvah with the tefillin. Oh, but I uh, donated to a uh, Hanukkah party. Okay, so a few people ate. Okay, so you got another mitzvah. It's one. What is, well, there's no other way to get that many mitzvot. You bought a Sefer Torah for $100,000. Okay, so they read it three times a week. Let's say your Sefer Torah is the only Sefer Torah there is in the Beknesset. They read it. Each time they read, you get a mitzvah. So you get three mitzvahs a week. Where are you going to be getting 600,000 mitzvot? Every day. So when he's a partner in it, when someone is financing a Talmud Chacham, for every mitzvah he gets, you get. Zevulun, if Yisachar is getting uh, 600,000 mitzvot, Zevulun is getting 600,000 mitzvot. It's, it's, it's right. That's why and up to that point, and even uh, until the last few generations, where people pretty much, most Jews were religious, the best mitzvah you can possibly do is invest in a Tamit Chacham. Is invest in somebody who learns to all the time. Because it doesn't end... The benefit doesn't end. You can't get that many mitzvot and anything else. <coughs> in our generation, there's one other thing that some people say is even higher, which is kiruv. Those discs that uh, uh, we give out for Rabbi uh, Mizrahi, other rabbis that do kiruv, saving souls is the most extraordinary thing you, you can have as far as mitzvot. And the reason why is because when you save, help a tamit chacham, you're getting a part of every one of its mitzvot. When you save one soul, one person doesn't keep Shabbat, all of a sudden he becomes a Shona Shabbat. Every time he keeps, he keeps Shabbat, the person that helped him gets a mitzvah. Every time he does another mitzvah, because now he started a, a, a tshuva, not only keeping Shabbat, he started doing prayers, started doing tefillin, started doing other, other mitzvot. Each time that person does a mitzvah, goes into the, uh, into the person that helped him do a mitzvah. He gets married, helps his wife become religious, that goes into the account. They have kids. That goes into the account. There's endless amount of mitzvot that that person has. And also, when, when you talk about Gan Eden, there's one Gan Eden that's above all. Above all. Above all, even from Tamidim Chachamim, even from kings, even from everything. 
It's for people to actually bring back people to Hashem, save souls. So when you're actually thinking about these, you have two major things that you can get endless amount of mitzvot. If I'm going to donate $5, I'm going to donate $5,000. It doesn't really make a difference. I want to make sure that investment goes to the best possible place. So when he's doing that, when Zebulun is investing all of his money into this Talmud Chacham, he knows this is my best. This is this is better than my business. When someone donates to Rabbi Mizrahi or any rabbi out there, because he knows that he's going to help people do tshuva, he knows that I now become a partner in saving souls. So this becomes an endless reward because that person becomes religious, and all of his descendants are religious. So you have endless amount of reward coming from all of this. So again. This is not me asking for donations or anything like that. This is the key here is to understand that people donate money for nonsense. Nonsense. You have a synagogue, listen, we need a, I don't know, a new closet. Okay, yeah, I'll donate $5,000 for a closet. How much, how much, how many meets what you can get for $5,000? You know how many Tamidim Chachamim you can help for $5,000? No, I want to have a Hanukkah party or a Purim party. Okay, yeah, it's $15,000. We want to have something really elaborate this year. Oh, yeah, sure, just put my name on it, and I sponsored it. Okay, great. You know how many people you can help, how many souls you can save with $15,000? I'm not saying they shouldn't have these parties. They want to have these parties, have these parties. What can I tell you? But as, as a person that's learning to lie at 11, 12 o'clock at night, we have an opportunity to something to do something smarter. Mm -hmm. Just like you invest in Forex, just like you invest in real estate, just like you invest in anything in the world, you want the best return for your investment. Yeah. That's the bottom line. Okay, you wanna, if it's a few dollars, $20, $5, fine. But when you're talking about serious money, when it gets to the point where it's, you know, it's hurting your pocket, at least make it worth it. And that's, that's, that's the message here. That's what we learned from Yisachar and Zebulun. He's telling you, Zebulun is telling you, I can donate to anything. But I donate to Yisachar. And because of that, I got a reward in this world and the next world. In the next world, we already know. In this world, look, it's obvious. My name was mentioned before his even. Yaakov is giving us a message that we're going to remember forever. And he wants us to remember forever that someone financing Torah, financing the children of Hashem, mm -hmm. can't get better than that. So if it's not Hashem, that's what we all get to one day. Any questions? There's a lot more to the parasha, but you can get it in the other show. Anything? Amen. Amen.